that the economy is quite a bit stronger fundamentally than it was in the previous cycle. We're also just in an air pocket of economic uncertainty right now. When you start to get to this position in the cycle, this position of monetary policy stance, the economy just, it only has so much more forward momentum. I think in terms of something breaking, that could still be in front of us. If rates continue to rise the way that they've been rising, eventually there's going to be a financial accident. Eventually something is going to break. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. 470. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market slightly positive by 0.1% on the S&P 500. We have a new cycle high on a 10-year yield TK 470. 36. The way we got here, it's not just a cycle high, but it's the you know, second derivative of it, the first derivative, the third, fourth, and sixth derivative as well. It's a moonshot up in yield, and it's very technically elegant. Dean Kernett to start us strong here uh, in the six o'clock. I'll talk about that. I'd link it into this massive correlation this morning in currency markets. You up dollar stronger. Dollar's stronger, but it's the way it's stronger. It's stronger across everything. Maybe the Japanese are fighting a rear guard effort to keep yen off 150. It's sort of sophisticated. For non-global Wall Street, your head's going to be spinning with a lot of different numbers today. But the answer is markets are moving. Here's a question for you. Can this equity market live with it? This one's from Bank of America, Savita Supermanium, just yesterday. Equities can still work in a high rate environment. The S&P 500 returned 15% every year from 85 to 2005. <clears throat> on average. Lisa, when real rates were 3.5%, can we live with these real rates? At this level, at this pace of increase, this is really a key question where Savita Supermanium is actually among the Wall Street analysts in the minority, not the majority. You're seeing an increasing number of analysts come out and capitulate, whether it's Goldman Sachs, whether it's Morgan Stanley, although they've been <clears throat> calling for this for a while. This is going to hurt. It's got to hurt somewhere. And yet yesterday, tech stocks outperformed. So where is it going to hurt? It's kind of counterintuitive and not going back to the playbook people were expecting. You see the pain in the data. ISM manufacturing is getting better, not worse. Job oh, openings yes. out a little bit later, looking ahead to payrolls on Friday. The numbers are getting better. That's the, Well, on one hand, you could say, OK, you're seeing actually a resurgence in manufacturing. But prices paid came in lower than expected. So this is sort of the white hope, right, is that people are hoping that maybe we're going to get that immaculate disinflation, right. even that strength. It's going to be a welcome thing. The immaculate implosion is going to be commercial real estate. They're on short features. They're not 30-year mortgages. They're five, seven-year treatment. Everybody's going to refi. They may refi into strong hands and new money, but there's going to be some agony. The 10-year real yield, I've lost perspective, 2.33% is a true moonshot. And climbing, Andrew Honhor, City. Here's his view. You might be familiar with it already. This is his take. The upside surprise in ISM manufacturing further confirms that manufacturing PMIs have bottomed, could well go above 50. If that move above 50 materializes and is sustained, it would make a near-term recession, Bramo, even more unlikely. That's the take from City this it, morning. It feels as if more people are coming around to the Hollenhorst view of things, which maybe is the reason why we're seeing that rise in yields. Maybe it's a sign of U.S. strength, or maybe it's something else. And this, I think, is important to really note. J.P. Morgan coming out this morning and saying something doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel connected to fundamentals. Eddie Ardeni saying this is the resurgence of bond vigilantes. To me, it feels like people are testing when something will start to crack. And if it doesn't, well, then let's keep going because let's get more yields. The supply demand dynamic would suggest it it's might be Stuart Kaiser making a point that yields are rising for the wrong reasons, TK. That when you get upside to prices on the economic data and you get high yields, you can make that a good story. When you get yields higher off the back of Treasury refunding, the Bank of Japan pulling away from yield curve control, TK would argue that things are a little bit maybe a little bit more difficult. Yeah, well, I go back to the IMF five-year view of a global slowdown, and granted China is going to do okay here, four or five percent as a zeitgeist, but it's not going to do five, six uh, a percent. To your point on the reasons we're moving, all we can do is observe the data. I'm telling that's all the central banks can do is they're completely data dependent. Let's observe the price action. Equities <clears throat> right now positive by 0.1%, a small lift on the equity market. Yields high by a couple of basis points. Just south of that line of the sand at the moment, 470, 469.74. And in foreign exchange, 104 on the euro, TK 104. 85. Yeah, and something, John, you've been on top of. I'm trying to get it up here right now. How about a 30-year bond in Germany? 3.17%. Their 3.17% is in our 3.17%. Tell me that Europe doesn't have the same bond debt 
and banking problems we have. Based on what we've seen in Germany over the previous decade, I'd argue 3% in Germany, Lisa, is something like 5 6%. In the U.S., something like that, maybe higher. Considering we were negative is, and we had negative corporate this, debt being this sold, this is how they do it at Bridgewater. They just turn and say, "Yeah, it's equivalent to this in America." <laughs> Six, seven. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, you know, essentially, it's kind of done us this morning. You know, exactly. like seven, eight. Why not? Why not? Well, I mean, we can handle it. I will say that one thing that I find interesting is that with all the Fed's, uh, Fed speakers, there is a consensus that they need to hold rates higher for longer, and there is a consensus that we don't understand exactly what's going on. 8 a.m. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic, the latest among the Fed speakers kind of giving us this ambiguous mush of we're watching stuff and we're not sure, which is kind of where markets are, and they don't like this indirection. 10 a.m., we get that jolt job openings data. Again, this was data that was discounted not that long ago, and then the pandemic hit, and all of a sudden this became the preeminent data highlighting the, the weakness or the strength of the labor market. We are expecting it to come in, but still remain strong, and today total vehicle sales will be trickling out throughout the day. This will be fascinating to the manufacturing point yesterday of the ISMs. We're seeing strikes. We're seeing loan uh, rates going uh, sky high, and still they're expecting an increase in total vehicle sales. So just again, this, unsur this sort of surprising strength underpinning a lot of the uh, goods in addition to services. Elisa, thank you. You dare head. Joining us around the table, Dean Kernett, founder, CEO of Macro Risk Advisors. Dean, good morning. Good morning. Are yields climbing for the wrong reasons? I would say so. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's not a higher for longer. Um, as you noted, the, the data is coming in. It's not exactly accelerating. So it's not an increase in inflation uh, break-evens. It's a real rate thing. And I think that's really just about indigestion. You know, the, the Treasury came and surprised the market with this um, new needs for supply, uh, just a voracious appetite for deficit spending. Um, you know, Jonathan, I, I study financial market history and specifically episodes of all. And so we're at the 25th anniversary of LTCM back in 1998. And God. in doing the research on that, I learned a couple things. One is the Yankees won 125 games that year. Okay, that's not happening. S second, <laughs> Sosa and Maguire hit 135 home runs combined. Steroids. And most importantly, the true five... Absolutely. Uh, the true five standard deviation event was that the U.S. produced a bu government budget surplus. Uh, and so that's not going to happen ever again. <laughs> also steroids. Uh, and so I think so much of this is the fiscal side. People use the term fiscal dominance. Um, you know, obviously we had the, the central banks running the show for a decade post the GFC, and it's really flipped. And so I, I look at the back end of the yield curve as really a function of markets have got to clear at a certain price. And there's just too much supply coming against coming against QT at the same time. So it's it's a it's a precarious time. Raises a really important question then. Is history any guide? When we start to say we can live with these kind of levels of real rates, is history any guide to whether we can live with this or not? If yields are climbing for the wrong reasons? Yeah, I would say not really. Uh, in fact, uh, again, just looking at history, I just remembering the bond market massacre from 1994. So this is un unbelievable. It was October 1993. The 10-year yielded 5.2%. A year and a half later, it was at 7.8%, so a 250-odd basis point increase. Year-over-year -year CPI was unchanged during that period. So you can see how these rates can become unmoored relative to the inflation facts on the ground, but debt-to-GDP was 40% back then. It's now well over 100. So I'm concerned right. about that side of things. I would say that um, rates are very, a very self-correcting sort of thing. You know, Lisa, you talk about um, something's going to break. That's a rates lower situation. So either the economic medicine is ultimately going to work, and I would argue it absolutely will, uh, leading to, to lower growth and sort of a lower uh, just activity that brings down inflation, or something breaks. Either one of these is going to lead ultimately to lower rates. It's just a matter of, of when. In the last 48 hours, finally, we've got the Dean Kernick question. OMG, we can't go back up unless we get catharsis. Do we need a catharsis to turn and move higher? Operative question this morning. Yeah, I think ultimately for the market, and let's just use the S&P 500 as some example of the base risk asset, for that to become investable, we have to feel like we've seen the economic medicine take hold. Give me a VIX number on that. Not the two digits. Just yeah, no, I'd say, I'd say 25 to 30. I, I don't think it has to be a 50. Um, you know, I don't think you have the potential for sort of some contagious event like 2008, 
But certainly you can go back to the 2022 episode where we saw VIX into the low 30s for a period of time. What I find interesting about what you just said is that whatever pathway, whatever remedy, whatever monetary policy you end up getting, it's going to be essentially a self-correcting lower rates going forward. What happens if that doesn't happen? What happens if there is no financial accident? And this is sustainable, and we live with 4.7% rates. How much more volatility do we end up seeing in some of the risk assets that have been remarkably resilient? Yeah, so again, I, I think about the two channels. One is the accident channel. It's the SVB. We were talking about uh, losses on bank balance sheets due securities holdings. I think the increase in the 10-year was 40 basis points in Q2. It's double that in Q3. So we know those rates, unless there was some magical hedging we don't know about, those losses are going to be even more substantial. So I think the potential for an accident is there. But these higher rates ultimately are going to bite. And I, you know, I think it's interesting to listen to the Fed speak. Um, you got guys like Powell and folks like Williams that I think are more, hey, I think we're close to done. And then folks like Mester and Michelle Bowman who were saying, oh, I think there's one, maybe two more. But all of them say we're going to get here and hold. And I think even the holding is going to be quite a problem uh, for, for the U.S. economy. Who is feeling the pain from the increase that we've been seeing that just has been like a train uh, running through? Yeah, well, we, we know, obviously, the housing market is at a standstill. Your best asset on your balance sheet is your 3.5% 30-year fixed mortgage. CRE, you know, that's going to be the first disaster. It's obviously already in motion, and the banks are a big funder of that. So I think, you know, a lot of times the Fed talks about we're going to raise rates that's going to decrease the demand for things because the cost of credit, but the supply of credit is going to go down as well. Folks are sitting on decisions they made that turns out in hindsight were poor, buying 1.5% 30-year you know, treasury bond. So that capital process, I think, is in the process of, of breaking down. And that's the second part. I mean, there's the accident part, and then there's the, the medicine of just lower availability of credit ultimately is going gonna, is gonna to take hold. Have we neutralized that? The banks that are sitting on the long end, that are sitting on all these unrealized losses, some of these 30-year issues out of the Treasury from a couple of years ago trading at something like 50 cents on the dollar. Right. Has the Federal Reserve neutralized that since spring? Um, you know, they, they have this obviously available for sale, hold to maturity, this sort of fictitious thing. We're going to put sort of a pile of them over here. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, is there, is there another SVB in the offing? I, I'm always never want to close the door on things like that. You've always got to really be looking over your shoulder for some episode of, of risk that you weren't contemplating. Um, it's just to me that even if you don't get an accident, the supply of credit is going to go down uh, because these folks are, you know, in situations, again, let's use CRE as the, as the front and center one that's going to come first in terms of its maturity wall. That's where the supply of credit's damaged m most quickly in 2024. So sit in the front end and wait. Just yeah, I, I, listen, I think of cash as a beautiful option right now. You know, <laughs> two-year note at five plus percent. Boy, you're getting paid to wait. And it's going to rally strong if growth gets dented and the Fed cycle gets upended. Dean, this was awesome. Thank you. As always, Dean Kernett of Macro Risk Advisors. Well cash is a beautiful thing, TK. Well, cash is a beautiful thing. Good morning, Ray Dalio. But, you know, what, what's, what's interesting about this is the emotion or lack thereof that's out there. And I don't see the emotion in the equity uh, markets. I have in the Bloomberg Total Return Index a 2% down in price gets us to new lows for bonds. What's it going to look like on people's statements where Bud and Ethel go, uh, <clears throat> how about that 18-month CD? Well, here's the thing, right? It's basically the stock market responding to this idea that essentially yields will go down, that there will be a financial accident. I know this feels like one step too far in game theory, but if people believe that if it's not sustainable, then you end up with yields going down. And if it is sustainable, then there's enough strength to keep the equity market going. Either way, heads we, you know, win, tails I, I, I you lose. I would go back to the hope and prayer, not of the optimist, but people observing data, the three-month annualized disinflation trend is well under 3%. That's not in the market right now. That's not being priced in. This conversation is going to continue. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo in the next hour, coming up very shortly. Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy on the latest in Washington, D.C. A serious conversation in the bond market about fiscal issues being priced slowly, then all at once. I'm not sure that serious conversation is happening down in Washington, D.C. The conversation up next, live from New York. Good morning.
All eyes turn to the U.S. job market. The jobs report, it beckons. It looks like companies are just holding on, holding on, holding on to workers. What you see is what you get. We're seeing a lot of strength. This Friday, Tom, Jonathan, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. This is exactly what the Fed is looking for. They now believe you can get back to 2% without damaging the labor market at all. We might get a bigger whammy than we expect. The September Jobs Report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I think the American people deserve to know the coalition that really governs them. And Kevin McCarthy likes to pretend that he makes coalition with conservatives. But all he really does is break his word with conservatives. The yellow brick road of working with Democrats has been paved, constructed, engineered, and architected by Kevin McCarthy. If he's able to stay in power, it will be him working for the Democrats, continuing to do their bidding. So this is a revealing exercise, and I think it'll show the country who's really in charge. This is one way of getting attention down in Washington, D.C. Congressman Matt Gates of Florida speaking after finding a resolution late Monday to oust Kevin McCarthy as House Speaker. Live from New York City, welcome to the program this morning. As Washington, D.C. plays internal politics and fighting and all of that bad stuff, this is the market for you. Equities on the S&P 500 virtually unchanged for a second straight session in the bond market. The sell-off resumes. Yields higher by a couple of basis points, just short of 470. Breached that level earlier on in the session for a new intraday cycle high on a 10-year maturity, 469.95. With that yesterday, the dollar stronger against absolutely everything in G10. Bit weaker against the euro this morning, 104.81 TK on that currency pair. But here we are down at 104. And the likes of Jordan Rochester over in Amura on yeah. this program, talking up or rather talking down of 102. And I've got to admit, the euro's distorted today, 104.82, and yen really doesn't move. You really wonder what the shenanigans are with the yen. I got a 149.89. I didn't get to a 150 on yen, and I think that's a lot to do with uh, their system uh, over there. But, you know, it's a different toxic brew than it was on Monday, but nevertheless, those tensions are there. Hi, the session, 149.93 on dollar yen. We're like... This far away. Lisa, what this do you think? Away. What are you watching on the screen, Lisa? I'm just watching bond yields. I mean, it's really that simple. She, Ten-year bond yields so and focused, ten-year real yields. You know, she this hasn't is looked the at story. The, she hasn't looked at the equity market Can I just say, since Nixon was president. I was talking about how <clears throat> some of the uh, some of the tech stocks actually outperformed yesterday. I will just say this. Even Kit Jukes came out from Sociedad General talking about how the FX market is just simply in the peanut gallery watching the bond market waiting for it to break something. And that Agreed. seems to be the trade into the dollar. Oh. And we see that consistently. And we have throughout the past, I don't know, what, 10 weeks, 11 weeks? 10-year real yield, 3, 2.35%. 2.35%. And that advances this morning. Should we do politics? I'd love for you to do politics. Let's do yeah. politics. Terry Haynes joins now with historical perspective. And this is what you've got to know in terms of the look back that we're doing. There are people that arc the American experience. Joe Cannon heard Douglas and Lincoln at the debates in the 1850s. Drag it forward 60 Joe Cannon years to 1910, where a Speaker of the House, the gentleman from, I believe it was Illinois, was basically going to be thrown out. He survived. Terry Haynes on the new Joe Cannon, Kevin McCarthy. Terry, I, I look at this and I don't think there's any parallels there. What is the distinctive feature of this attempt against this Speaker of the House? Uh, really two, Tom. One kind of uh, Washington small ball and one for the markets. Uh, the Washington small ball is that it shows that uh, the House is uh, pre pretty much ungovernable to begin with. Uh, you know, Mr. Gates uh, wants to uh, talk about, uh, you know, that people deserve to know how the House is governed. Well, you know, he's showing them, uh, <laughs> uh, perhaps inadvertently. Uh, but in, in a bigger context, I mean, what you what markets see is there's no United States government attempt to deal with the debt or deficit, with entitlements, uh, you know, anything else. And, and that failure is by and large bipartisan. Anybody that uh, doesn't believe me uh, needs to remember that they went off on vacation for seven weeks instead of dealing with any of this. So this crisis is self-created. And, uh, you know, at a time where you all have been talking about the bond market and a variety of other real world consequences, uh, what ought to concern everybody is that Washington doesn't even understand how its own mm -hmm. governance failures are affecting the broader markets.
When you look at the government failures that are out there, what do the next two, three, four days look like? Don't they have a required two days to do something? Uh, they do. And at the same time, uh, there are procedural motions that happen first. Uh, McCarthy may well escape uh, uh, by the skin of his teeth. But the net net of this is that, you know, the House has been a, de a delicate coalition from day one. And uh, it's going to get, uh, regardless of how this turns out, it's going to get even more ungovernable, either with McCarthy there or McCarthy deposed, because uh, whoever, take, whoever takes the job or thinks about taking the job is going to have even more more onerous conditions placed upon him than McCarthy will. So, uh, so this is very bad for uh, for for anything fiscal and even for uh, avoiding a, a, a shutdown in 45 days. Terry, I'm so pleased you touched on this. The conversation we had with Congressman French Hill yesterday, the privilege of acting recklessly for a long, long time. Washington government has had the privilege of acting recklessly to have big debates prolonged, messy over the debt ceiling, government shutdowns. Terry, a question we asked French Hill, and he responded by saying, I don't think they get it. Do you think they understand in Washington that they're losing the privilege of acting recklessly with the nation's debt? No, I don't. I don't think they uh, they understand that at all. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's uh, as the, the great uh, philosopher uh, Gary Trudeau in his comic strip Doonesbury once said, even in utopia, there's myopia. Uh, the myopia here, the navel gazing here, the idea that uh, you know whatever kind of People magazine uh, uh, drama that goes on in the House or the Senate uh, is the be all and end all of politics, and that they don't have a broader responsibility uh, is rife. Uh, the lack of humility is rife uh, everywhere, and uh, and you know, that's going to continue. But th that's playing into, as you all know, because I've, I've heard you talk about it, that's playing into bigger market decisions. And the gradual degradation of uh, Washington political credibility is something I think they don't they, they don't even understand they need to pay attention to. Right now, we're looking at a potential trillion dollars of interest payments in 2025, probably more at this point, given how quickly yields are going up. When does Congress have to actually address this, face this off, and account for this in a budget that's already crimped and uh, really facing some concerns about pushback without really dealing with the big issues? Uh, the last time they did, they tried to do this or tried to start that process was about 25 years ago with a balanced budget uh, uh, agreement and uh, and surpluses that were largely disrupted by 9-11 and the, uh, the fallout from that. Um, when do they have to? Yesterday. When will they? Uh, as long as there is a closely divided Congress, uh, they're very unlikely to. Uh, that said, you know, one of the things I always tell you uh, and tell markets is that uh, don't dis don't don't misunderstand that there are lots of centrists uh, in the Congress, in the Senate, and in the House who actually want to address all these things and want to do so in a responsible way. And, uh, you know, what we may end up seeing, uh, probably not in this Congress, but the next, is the rise of those centrists to, uh, you know, once uh, markets put pressure on them, frankly. Terry, wonderful to get your perspective as always. Good morning to you, sir. Terry Haynes there of Pangea Policy. There's two issues, Lisa. Perhaps they're separate. You've got all the bond supply, the deficit, the debt pile. Then you've got the dysfunction on top of that. Is this playing off the dysfunction or just the debt pile, the debt supply? From my, uh, from from what I've been reading, and I will sort of uh, trust the experts in this more than myself, they really just talk about the debt supply, given the fact that it's increasing as much as they are. And the dysfunction goes to this idea that they're not going to get it under control. They're not going to reduce spending in any kind of way. There's not going to be a policy prescription to move forward. What is ironic about this whole thing, Fed's not buying until something breaks. Maybe then they'll start to lower rates. It's almost as if people are hoping something breaks in the market so that we can go back yeah, to an that's era always been that's gone. Yeah, What's that's even always, more important, yeah. TK, just to jump in, yeah. is the context. Yeah. This is happening in an expansion, not a downturn. And I think that's what's difficult to get this market to say, you know what, let's buy the 10 year. Let's go out and take on some duration. Mm -hmm. With the ISM improving, with jobless claims down at 200K, with unemployment with a three handle, Tom, yeah. it's difficult to get there. Dead on. And as Jamie Dimon said to Emily Chang yesterday, you know, we have a technological edge. I, I mean, the people in America that benefit from technology are fine. There's a lot of other people where there's some stress, to say the least. Perfect guest to talk about this, TK. Robert Tibb, P. Jim, Finks did come. Yes. Joining us next from New York City this morning. Good morning. Equities up by about 0.1% on the S&P 500. A new intraday cycle high on a U.S. 10-year, 470. 
36. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Welcome to the program. Good morning to you. Equities on the S&P 500 positive here by 0.1%. Yesterday, virtually unchanged. Kicking off Q4, going absolutely <coughs> nowhere. On the Nasdaq up by 0.09%. Counting it down to payrolls on Friday and earnings season kicking off next week. Yes. With JP Morgan. Next Friday, Tom, two Fridays away. Yeah. The 13th, Friday the 13th for JP Morgan numbers. It's going to be interesting to see. Right now we're looking at the screen. What's really important for surveillance and the way we develop the show is we don't talk about what we're going to do in a data check. All three of us look at different material. And trust me, I'm, I'm the, the, the least into it. And, you know, I learn a lot when John and Lisa bring out a certain point. John, you were starting, and I just happened to have up GBP USD. And I'm star sorry, there's no bid there. This is weak sterling this morning, ready to breach through the new lows of 120.63. Remember post Brexit when breaching 120 was like the major I remember major post Brexit, but you yeah, did 10 too, hours sure. straight. And you did. And I was having breakfast in Mayfair. I remember that um, very I'm, clearly. I'm well aware. Post Brexit. <laughs> He did turn up at work uh, for the. Uh, very nice, good. I like nice. that. Thanks. He did turn up post <laughs> breakfast for the London Open. I yeah. remember that. We sat there watching bank stocks just plummet, yeah. which seems ridiculous now at the time looking back. But that was the initial Look reaction. At Sterling just give way. There's we'll get no to foreign exchange this morning on this stuff. in a second time. I want to turn to the bond market Please, just briefly. Out of control. Two year, ten year, thirty year, <laughs> always, never change. <laughs> it's going to say ten year right now. Four sixty nine fifty three yields up a couple of basis points there on a ten year earlier new cycle high. Three four seventy yesterday again this morning. Four seventy thirty six on a thirty year into the four eighties. Hello. Up two basis points, 481.29. With those kind of moves, this is why the dollar absolutely dominated G10 yesterday. Here's a snapshot of things <clears> against the euro, against the yen. Against the euro, 104.78. 11 weeks of euro weakness. Can we make it week 12? On dollar yen, very, very close to 150 at about time 149.89. Yeah, not through 150 yet. That's maybe an emotional dot 10,000 like level for the Bank of Japan and the Ministry of Finance. He came out of Berkeley, the first job he had, and we're going to get to the interview of the day on bonds. We've got to do under surveillance, John. But I'm sorry, stay with us, Global Wall Street. We're going to do it next with You're Robert. You're jumping Tip. a gun today, aren't you? I, I just, I'm, I'm psyched. Robert Tips on, and this is what you want in this kind of market. Well, let me get through under this surveillance. First. Okay. Let's go. Under surveillance this Gates. morning. <laughs> Gates. You're not, you're not slowing it's us not down, Bill are Gates. you? <laughs> Republican Matt Gates. Former starting a motion to remove House Speaker Kevin McCarthy from his position, citing McCarthy's support of a bipartisan deal to avoid a government shutdown as justification for the motion. A House vote could come as soon as today, with McCarthy needing a simple majority to survive the motion. Bramo, what a mess down in Washington. All this screams to me is that November 17th, we're, we're going to be doing the same dance all over again. Are we going to get any clarity in between now and November 17th, the new deadline? Probably not. And the issues that we're dealing with with fiscal uh, policy, which really are being expressed in the bond market, as many people say, probably are not going to be addressed. Let me wrap up the Fed speak for you as well. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester seeing one more rate hike this year, saying this, I suspect we may well need to raise the Fed funds rate one more time this year and then hold it there for some time. That contrasts against the thoughts of Fed Vice Chair for Supervision Michael Barr, who said the Fed is, quote, likely at or very near a sufficiently restricted level of rates. Lisa, I get the sense this is a difference of degree and not in kind on the FOMC. There's hardly anything between someone you might describe as hawkish and someone you might describe as dovish. That was exactly where I was going to go with this, that essentially you're seeing consensus right now that hold for a long time is the consensus. The details around the edges of one more hike or not is sort of a wash. What I find more interesting right now, and I'm curious about some of these Fed officials, are they happy about the move in the long end of the bond, deal, uh, bond curve? Are they excited to see the market come around to their view? Finally, yes, we're going to hold rates longer, uh, higher for longer, and that will actually uh, inflict the pain they've been looking for. Is that what you're going to hear, or are they getting a little bit concerned about the pace of this move? Well, they're not complaining about it, no. are they? Which makes you think that perhaps they are happy tolerating exactly. it for now. Maybe it changes. I want to turn to this just finally. Jamie Dimon telling Bloomberg's Emily Chang that AI is already being used by thousands of employees at J.P. Morgan and that it's likely to lead to vast improvements in workers' quality of life. Technologies always replace jobs. Your children are going to live to 100 and not have cancer because of technology. And literally, they'll probably be working three and a half days a week. And pause. Okay, I hope he's right. 
I hope he's right. And when I saw this yesterday, this is exactly what I thought. Away from Jamie, so it's not too personal. I hope that if we all make these massive productivity gains, we all work less. But haven't we made massive productivity gains in the last 50 years and we're still working the same amount, if not more? Working more. So how can we have any faith that any business leader gets more productivity out of Bramo and then says, you know what, Lisa, you can only work three and a half days. I think they just want output up. And ultimately, Lisa, you'll be working five days. I will be too. And TK as well. Or if I'm working three and a half days, I'll be paid for three and a half days. And I'll have to go get another job for one and a half days to compensate for the uh, college bills, et cetera. But so this is the question, right? Essentially, oh, if you're working I... three and a half days, is that a better quality of life? Or is that less pay that forces you out and to make ends meet somewhere else? The chart of the week, and I'm making it up, the ratio of executive compensation to workers' compensation has gone from, like, off the top of my head, 30 to 1 to 400 to 1. I've talked to the laureate Paul Romer about this. The singular feature was the equitization at capital gains treatment of executive compensation. That's where it changed. That's that's. Harry Kane was with the tots. He left. <laughs> That's where it changed. On this debate, it was about the equitization of equity compensation. This is the conversation I had with Michael Spence in the last week, Tom. I think he'll yeah. appreciate this. And the stat that's in their book, Perma Crisis, Spence, Brown, Alarian. The stat that they point out on manufacturing is that China's share of global manufacturing in 1990 was something like 3.5%. And a little more than 30 years later, that had gone to 305 and a question we're all asking is whether AI can do to services what globalization did to manufacturing. That's a hope and prayer. Now, if AI yeah. is going to rip up services, I don't think that's a hope or prayer, Tom. I think that could well be a nightmare at the same time. If you rip up yeah. services with AI and you don't have the right kind of guardrails to protect workers and you repeat the mistakes of the last 30 years with manufacturing and you do it with services, this is why I say I hope Jamie Dimon's right. I really do. I hope for a better world and we all work less to enjoy it. I fear that we'll make the same mistakes that we've made over the last 30 years and repeat them all yeah. over again. My sense of globalization influenced by Stiglitz as we go to a more narrow, successful audience or society versus a broader society from another uh, time and place. This is the interview of the day for Global Wall Street on where we are with bills, notes, and bonds. Robert Tipp out of Berkeley had a shingle out at First Boston a few years, a few years ago. Definitive at PGM Fixed Income, Chief Investment Strategist. Robert, why is this move in bonds different than the other 18 you've witnessed? Well, there are similarities and there are differences. The thing that you don't see very often that we're seeing right now is the change paradigm. We were in an environment for a decade post-financial crisis, post-European peripheral crisis, where the central tendency for the 10-year Treasury was two, and for the Bund, it was around zero. And I think the Fed you know, is, is looking at the data coming across, across the transom. They're saying we need to be at five plus and we're comfortable up and around the zip code. And I think that's because they are looking at the data and the data is telling them that, you know, four is the center of the range and they need to have policy a little bit at the restrictive end of the range until they get inflation down. And the same is going on in, in Europe uh, where they're going to be engineering a higher interest rate environment there. This is the, the end of the financial crisis, the end of the peripheral crisis, and return to more normal level of bond yields. I look at what PGM does, Prudential, your work with Allstate for years, and it's about a shift in the actuarial assumption. What is the new, what is the next institutional pension actuarial assumption look like? Is it 200 beeps higher from where we are now? Yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't worry about... Uh, about them. I don't think they ever fully adjusted to the low interest rate environment. I don't think the equity markets adjusted, but I think the, the financial community will do fine with this level of interest rates of financial institutions. I think investors, though, and policymakers uh, are getting dragged kicking and screaming to the new environment, especially the investors. The biggest pitfall, I would say, in investing is adaptive expectations. There's a lot of distractions with the cyclical noise, the government shutdowns, each economic region being in its own business cycle, having differences from the others, it's very hard for people to wrap their arms around that. And the Fed readjusted. They were one of the few institutions that, that started to believe a 2.5% nominal Fed funds rate was going to be the neutral forever. And now they're you know, on the precipice of starting to move back up. Um, basically, you know, this environment was clear from early 2022 that we could be back in a 4 5 6% interest rate environment. I think that's the thing that people need to, to wrap their heads around here.
What you just said there, four, five, six percent interest rate, are you saying that the sell-off that we've seen in 10-year treasuries isn't done and that you see enough momentum and, uh, frankly, rationalization behind the move that yields could go beyond five percent to even six percent on the 10-year? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that that's not a base case, right? But if you imagine that the best news on inflation might be behind us, we have energy prices going up. We have a unique situation where high interest rates are crimping housing supply around the world at a time when housing is in short supply. That's a very unusual configuration. Uh, you could get some bad inflation numbers. You could get a signal that higher rates are coming from central banks. And the curve shape is only ready for rates to come back down. It's not really ready for the higher for longer kind of idea that you could, you know, as whether that's a one in six or a one in three, you could definitely end up between five and six on the tenure. I think it's more likely we're going to head up towards five. And then as we go through next year, thankfully, the fundamental data is really moderating. The underlying trends in inflation moderating, growth moderating. And in the U.S., less so than in other places, but even in the U.S., it is. Uh, this battle on inflation, as uh, our economist Tom Porcelli is fond of saying, is, is over. Uh, and we should be seeing the rates coming back down next year. But definitely, I think we've seen a, a move in that range, uh, back up towards the central tendency around four. And right now, the Fed's not convinced that the cycle's crested. So, yeah, there's upside risk. Robert, you're talking about the inflation outlook. You're not talking about the fiscal backdrop, which a lot of people say was known, right, that we're going to have uh, a real big uh, supply of, uh, of bond sales and not the Fed picking up the other side. Is that one of the main drivers or is this just fundamentally the data has been coming in better than expected? And this is an economy that needs a 5 percent 10 year yield, not a three and a half percent one. Yeah, I think up until you know, the turn of the century, you know, the, the supply bulges weren't that big. But since uh, the financial crisis, COVID, the fiscal situation is huge globally. We're dealing with governments that have much bigger debt stocks, much more rollover. And we've just come into the QT period where that means the central banks are no longer coming in and scooping up big chunks of the auction. So the markets now are forced to think about, think hard, about where things are every day. And on a day like yesterday, there were no treasury auctions of long-term notes and bonds, but I think there was over a hundred billion in bills. So uh, there is a relationship there. It tends to make curves steeper. It tends to make treasuries cheapen uh, relative to what's the true underlying riskless rate in the market. And I think that is one of the minor upward pressures contributing to this, this sell-off. We've seen that uh, with the downgrade. We saw it with the refunding announcement. And the other big driver is the Fed that's dragging the markets, kicking and screaming to the reality uh, that we're going to be up in the zip code, you know, for rates for some time to come. Not a zip code we've been in for a long, long time. Robert Tip, thank you, sir, of PGM Fixed Income. Haven't been in this zip code since 2007 on a 10-year yield. Your 10-year, 470, up two basis points. And speaking of auctions, $44 billion of 52-week bills coming to a market near you, Lisa, <laughs> 11.30 Eastern time. Numbers we've just sort of had to get used to. Although that's not been where the drama has been. And that's the interesting point. The bill market has actually been relatively stable relative to what we're seeing in the 10-year yield. I just keep thinking about this idea that crises happen in debt that's rated at AAA ratings or at the top levels. Crises happen in securities that are perceived as safe. Is there right. something else that we're missing when you what have such a massive sell-off in the benchmark safe asset of the world? We got, we got two things going on. The mother of all bet against equities right now. Any measurement you look at on the street, everybody's gloom, gloom, and doom. And the other thing I'd look at is a disinflationary force in place. People like Ed Heim and David Rosenberg, nobody's listening to them this morning. And yet yields aren't falling, they're climbing. They're climbing, and they're going the other way, and it's going to be cathartic and with a vengeance if you get the work out like they see. Crude back in the 80s, in the last 24 hours on Both WTI. We need to talk about that with Bill Kennedy on the crude market. That conversation coming up next. WTI, 88.35, Brent crude, $90.15 from New York. Good morning.
we don't think demand is going to come in stronger than expected unless for some reason there's a change in every economist's judgment about where uh, economic growth is going to be next year. But the drag from China, the drag from Europe, and what we expect is a drag from the United States coming into the market really weighs heavily. Ed Morse from City is not an all-market bull. He's looking for the 70s to return on WTI at some point next year. Ed Morse speaking to Bloomberg's Romain Bostic and Kenny Greifeld after their call from yesterday. That bearish call from Citigroup. From New York City this morning, good morning to you. Equity futures on the S&P 500, totally unchanged on the S&P. Yield time by a couple of basis points by the two basis points to 470 on a 10-year. In foreign exchange, 104.84 with positive tom by about 0.1%. It's interesting to see, and actually petroleum, I'd say, is one of the things that's not moved. I also note gold and silver having a great difficulty of it, and maybe that's that disinflationary tendency. I'm not saying people are talking about it, John, but remember, we were looking at $100 oil two cups of coffee ago, good, good Abu Dhabi coffee, and 90.17 on Brent is not where we were a week ago. Backing away just a little bit, but still yeah. in the 90s on Brent, Tom. Yeah. Just in the 80s on WTI. Raging debate. Right now, we are going to do this. We're going to go to Abu Dhabi. Yusuf has just done a great job out there. Daniel Jurgen with us the other day. We do even better than Daniel Jurgen. Joining us now, head of all of our hydrocarbon and commodity work worldwide, Will Kennedy darkens the door in the United Arab Emirates. And importantly, Abu Dhabi was in OPEC before the formation of the United Arab Emirates years ago. Will Kennedy, the view from Abu Dhabi, what is the power this morning of OPEC? I think that OPEC are ready to stay the course here. They're not too worried uh, about day-to-day uh, -day drivations in the market. Uh, obviously, this fallback that we've seen over the last two days will strengthen their conviction that their policy is correct and that they need to hold course, keep inventories falling, uh, tighten the market, keep a grip on the market. And we heard from the Emirati oil minister here yesterday, he had a long conversation with Bloomberg, and he said that the policy feels right to him. So I don't think we should see any change in the policy, which is to hold production down until the end of the year at least. The great split is personified by Ed Morris of Citigroup. Dr. Morris suggesting demand won't be there, and others saying demand will be there. What's the zeitgeist of this important event in Abu Dhabi? Are they demand plus or demand minus, demand careful? I, I, I think people are still fairly optimistic about demand, but, they, but, but I think that Ed's view about where the oil market going is now still a bit of an outlier. I think that when you talk to people here, they're still confident that uh, even if growth is not quite as strong in China, that they still want to see, they'll still see demand grow. We just spoke to the Indian oil minister and he's very positive about uh, India's energy demand, obviously the other great importer in Asia. He says, yes, there are economic issues. Yes, uh, energy costs do pose a, uh, 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 a problem, but uh, fundamentally energy demand continues to grow in these big emerging markets. Will, is one thing that we've learned over the past couple of months that OPEC Plus will not tolerate crude at the low $70 a barrel, that they want crude prices to stay in the level where they are currently? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, the conversation, I mean, it's less of a conversation this week than it was last week when we uh, saw that spike up towards $97 a barrel. I mean, there's a conversation of if we get to $100 a barrel, and I think most people in OPEC uh, although they don't target prices, are comfortable with the idea of $100 oil. If they got there, how much further would they want it to go? Because clearly there are economic dangers. And one of the things that we're seeing this week is perhaps this interplay between energy prices and interest rates is if they push too hard on the price, that might cause uh, central bankers to consider further tightening. And then you get some of the kind of market reaction that we've seen this week as interest rates rise and the dollar gets stronger. So it's a real question of, yes, I think OPEC is uh, comfortable with 100, but I think there would be a debate within OPEC about how much further than that they wanted to go. What's the mood like uh, over in Adapec? How do you pronounce it exactly? Adapec, I think? Nailed that. That was fantastic. I'm sure that I'll be uh, corrected by Will. Uh, I mean... I guess I'm, I mean, what I'm curious is, from you is just is in terms of, yeah. of... Go ahead. I mean, the, the, mood is, the mood is very strong. I mean, it's an absolutely packed event. There are acres of exhibitors here selling everything from 
pumps to winches to drill bits and uh, business, I think, is pretty mm. good. There's a lot of talk about how the industry can uh, lean into decarbonisation, uh, get on top of some of the uh, emissions within its own industry, methane and that kind of thing. But there is no gloom about the long-term prospects for oil demand um, here. I think people see it uh, pretty positively. Real Kennedy, simply, is Russia at ADAPEC, ADAPEC, E-I-E-I-O, is Russia there? <laughs> they are. Uh, we haven't seen any Russian ministers, but it's quite striking. There are a lot of Russian uh, energy companies exhibiting. I was wandering around earlier and Gazprom, the huge Russian gas company, has a big, big stand. And there's a whole Russian pavilion uh, full of uh, Russian uh, service providers, uh, Russian drilling providers, pipe manufacturers. Yeah. Uh, there is no uh, issue between the UAE and Russia. There are lots of Russians here doing business. And Russia, when you're here, is clearly still part of the global oil and gas industry. Can you just see Will going kiosk to kiosk at this exhibition, <laughs> picking up the merch? I mean, yep. tell me, the merch at the Russian kiosk, it's, come on, it's got to be a good bottle of vodka. <laughs> good bottle of vodka and good some merch. caviar. Well, I am curious, Will, as we look forward to just how much OPEC Plus can determine the price of oil. I mean, we were talking earlier about how they want oil prices kind of where they are. Have we gotten any sense of whether they've lost control over prices or have they only consolidated their dominance in the past couple of months? I think that they feel pretty good about their influence in the oil market right now. I feel that I suspect that they feel like they have a grip of things. If you think about the actors who can change the narrative on oil on the supply side, it's only OPEC and that really at the moment means Saudi Arabia, uh, the UAE and Russia if you took broaden out to OPEC plus. It's only those players that can really dial uh, oil and gas production up and down and that gives them huge influence and sway over the market. Now the demand side is of course a different question and the big risk for OPEC is that we see a big slowdown in the global economy but they then probably have levers that they could pull in that circumstance but it's hard to see where more supply is coming from. There is a big deficit in the oil market even if oil demand softens a bit. Right now there is a big deficit in the oil market created by these OPEC plus cuts and inventories are falling uh, fast and there is a big demand for oil now which is sucking uh, oil out of storage and that's exactly where Saudi Arabia and its allies and OPEC plus want things to be. So then we will have our up and downs week to week but I suspect if you talk to OPEC ministers they feel pretty good about where the market is and their role in it. I saw some of those numbers out of Cushing last week speaking of what Will's talking about. Will, great coverage from you and the team over the last couple of days. Will Kennedy there of Bloomberg on the commodity market on crude. Right now Brent $90.20, WTI $88.50. Speaking of the merch, TK, a long time ago I was in Milan and Berlusconi at the time is operating as Berlusconi used to. You'd go around the corner and they'd have all these little kiosks, these little tables, stands, politicians, mm -hmm. political parties, giving out some merch. Go around the corner, lined up, pasta, prosecco, band at the end, Silvio Berlusconi getting it done. <laughs> I mean, it was unbelievable <laughs> just to see it, Tom, just to see it. That was proper merch it's, back yeah, in the day. that was proper merch. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, I would uh, suggest so. so and, you know, I, I find it interesting, and Youssef has done a great job there. I thought the Jurgen interview, the Morse interview, these were fascinating. I mean, it, it, there's a whole mystery to every moment we're in right now. My, my only keel here, if you want my lodestone, I'm sorry. I'm up two basis points, 2.35% on the 10-year real yield. What does that do to our world? All I know is that that interview highlighted why oil prices are, are going up because, you know, the whole Zoom and the remote delay ha has been exhausting for so many people that now they're going to be in person. Nice. And they're flying around. And, you know, it was really just you, an example. You give that some thought. Yeah, yeah. That was. <laughs> As to why that crashed and burned. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Well, this is why we're bullish crude. We want less of that. <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, why aren't Zoom meetings taking over the in-person meetings? Because people want the lack of delay and the connectivity. Right, okay, this is good. I'm really nice. old school on this, and I think it speaks to the surveillance travel schedule looking out into summer. Of oh, year. I'm sure okay. it does. You got to go for I know where you're trying to go. You know, you yeah. go where? Oh, I I used to go to G7 in know. Italy. Jesus, I mean, Pharaoh, I promise Pharaoh, you know, I know, because it's beautiful. Go, you know, the mother country. Nice. At least Father, father country, technically, but yeah. Well, I, the father I'm country. Sure. Okay. That works. That's great.
Crude. <laughs> $90.20. Chris Harvey, Wells Fargo, not the commodity sure market. <laughs> on equities, can we live with yields up here on a 10 year 470.57? We'll get by, we'll survive. Yields up three <laughs> basis points. Can this equity Such market is. flourish with bond yields where they are? That's the conversation next from New York. Good morning. The economy is quite a bit stronger fundamentally than it was in the previous cycle. We're also just in an air pocket of economic uncertainty right now. When you start to get to this position in the cycle, this position of monetary policy stance, the economy just, it only has so much more forward momentum. I think in terms of something breaking, that could still be in front of us. If rates continue to rise the way that they've been rising, eventually there's going to be a financial accident. Eventually something is going to break. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm going to start every show just quoting the 10-year, 470, 57. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market slightly negative on the S&P 500 on a 10-year TK, 470, 57. These are markets on the move like yesterday, but different than yesterday. You're getting real confirmation in DXY through 107. The currency's all uh, weaker against a dollar. I did a very careful study. We won't waste time on it this morning, John. We'll do it later. Uh, but this dollar strength is tangible. It's not urgent, but it's tangible right now. Dollar index 107. Lisa, euro dollar 104. Dollar yen getting closer and closer this morning to 150. Yeah, but no one really wants to test the 150 line in the sand that the Bank of Japan Lines. has put out for. I mean, that's essentially why you're seeing this sort of threshold, or that seems to be the implication. I will just note that something that Robert Tipp of PGM Fixed Income uh, said last hour that I thought was really important, that the rest of the yield curve is only prepared for rates to go lower in the near term. It seems like the 10 year is moving and other things, including equities and including other parts of the fixed income market, are not going along with it. They're basically counting on this to be a temporary blip and that it's going to right size itself. At the long end, I'd say line them up. I've got a lot of guests now that I can name off who think that this move we're seeing at the long end is associated with this Treasury reissuance, the refunding announcement back at, later in the summer. And Lisa, that we're starting to say this just a little bit more seriously with a 30 year now through 480 this morning. And it's a global move because this is the full faith and credit, the benchmark yield of so many other uh, markets as well. At what point, though, does this have to trickle out in a more meaningful way into other markets, into other parts of the debt sphere? I mean, how much can this be isolated to the 10 year and the 30 year versus fixed income that goes into high yield bonds, that goes into investment grade credit? At what point does this crimp? the way that the channels of credit get disseminated. Happening slowly. High yield spreads, as you saw, I know, three, 400 basis points. Earlier in the spring when we had the banking difficulty, <coughs> three, 500, so we're certainly not there. But Tom, it's happening. It's happening slowly, yes, granted, but ultimately it is moving in that direction. Spreads wider. Well, it spreads wider and it's grinding, and Lisa's better at that than I am. But I'm going to look at the headline data here and what's not happening, as we mentioned with Dean Kernett, which is catharsis in the equity market. Even where, you know, I got a VIX of 17.93. That states to me, John, equities are removed for what we're seeing in bonds and currency. Let's get to stocks right now. Slightly negative on the S&P 500. Lots of data and Fed speak to talk about. We'll do that in just a moment. Equities going almost nowhere yesterday, going almost nowhere this morning. Yields are going somewhere higher, very close to 471 right now. 470.99. I can tell you just seconds ago, Lisa, 471.19 on a 10-year yield. People who try to buy are having a very hard time. And you see that every morning where people try to buy at 8 a.m. We do get Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic adding to some of the Fed speak that we've gotten recently. And John, I think that you put it really well, which is trying to parse the differences between these different Fed speakers is really a matter of just the details. At the core, they are all sending the message higher for longer. They are all on the same page. 10 a.m. We get Jolt's job openings. How much do we oh. see ongoing strength at a time where you have seen job openings go down? Uh, but Tom, you know, we're still at really high okay. levels relative to history. Help me here. I'm out of touch here on the McKee number that matters. This is a big deal today, right? Jolt is like Maybe. a big deal. Maybe. I mean, this is sort of the question is, where is the market biased? Are they looking for better than expected data to sell off at the 10-year? Are they really going to go screaming into 10-year treasuries if we get a worse than expected number? I don't know. I think that the market response may be more interesting than what we actually get from the data. And total vehicle sales will come throughout the day. And again, John, this speaks to what you were talking about before, that we were expecting manufacturing to drag services down 
Instead, you saw the ISMs yesterday outperform. We're expecting an increase in total vehicle sales, regardless of the strikes, regardless of interest rates, regardless of the fact that consumers have less discretionary spending. Decent data. Strongest production growth going back to July 2022 on ISM manufacturing. The president engaging with the program this morning. He knows that Anne-Marie appears in about 10 minutes' time, so he tweeted this. <laughs> Speaker McCarthy and a majority of House Republicans must keep their word and secure passage of the support needed to help Ukraine as it defends itself. We are the indispensable nation in the world. Let's act like it. TK, that's the latest from the president, given the spat that's taking place down in Washington between and across, Republicans. And, and across his history with foreign relations and his nuclear expertise, he's speaking with some authority of 50 years there of where the U.S. fits in to all the complexities. AMH joining us in about 10 minutes' time. Look out for that conversation down in Washington. Joining us right now around the table, Chris Harvey, Head of Equity Strategy at Wells Fargo. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. Would you like to start with the old price target or the newer price target? Because <laughs> the old price target was 4200 on the S&P. Are you more comfortable with that than the 4420 that you upgraded it to? No, we're, we're okay with the, the 4400, right? So at the beginning of the year, what we said is our base case is 42. 44 is a soft landing. Doesn't look like we're going to have a hard landing this year, so we just bumped it up to 44. Um, the range that we think we're in is that 42 to 46. We think we're going to spend more time at the top end of the range. Right now, we're just taking, mm -hmm. taking some froth out of the market, repricing risk, and we're waiting to see when the bond buyers start to show up. All in yields are approaching that 590 level that we saw back in October. Um, CPI is down 200 basis points since, since then. It looks like the Fed tightening cycle is over, close to being over buyers should start to materialize, we'll see. What I find interesting here is you're the single best qualified person to ask this question to. In your ute, you were out in the romance of 54 degree water, <laughs> clamming in Long Island to pay uh, the bills. I want to know, and this really works, where's your line in the sand with the equity markets right now? Where's the tension point that's the Harvey line right. in the sand? You know, Tom, I'm, I'm going to, like all good equity strategists, I'm going to shift, and, and politicians, I'm going to shift because yesterday was really, really interesting. It brought me back to 99, 2000, because what happened? Interest rates went higher, old economy stocks went down, new economy stocks went up. That was so reminiscent yeah. of 99, 2000. So when you ask me for a line in the sand, I can't give you a line in the sand because the markets are not yeah, reacting. But there was a march before. distant from that where there was a line in the sand for all of us, which is oops. How <laughs> close are we to oops? I, I don't think we're close to oops. Uh, what I think is what we're saying is 4,200, that's the technical level. We think that level holds. We have to wait for, we have to wait for rates to kind of wash out here. There's been a lot of talk about rates, but we think you should start to see buyers showing up, especially those all-in buyers, pretty soon. The other thing we'd like to see is we'd like to see something from one of the Fed members saying something about rates in the back end, because uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe John said this before, um, if you look at what's happened to the 10-year, right, since the issue and since, since Janet Yellen said, hey, we're going to need a lot more paper, real rates have gone straight up and real rates have dried nominal up. This has not been about fundamentals. And so we may have to wait until November to find out what the needs are in the short term. We find out in November that, that the needs aren't as bad, then we can, find, uh, we can find some ground, we can find some bidders. But in the interim, maybe one of the Fed members comes out and says something. We'll see. Is the 4450 call that you have predicated on the idea of rates going down or just staying where they are and not moving as rapidly? Really just what we need is we need stability. Rates don't need to go down from here. What we're seeing is the underlying fundamentals are still good. We just got through a period where we had a major, conf major conference season. We had pre-announcements. The pre-announcements were pretty benign. And so we think the underlying fundamentals are fine for now. So we just need rates to stop because if we don't know where the top in rates will be, we don't know where the bottom in the equity market is going to be. That's important, Chris. You don't need them to go down. You just need them to stop going up. That's right. That's right. Are you seeing signs that tech leadership is stabilizing based on what you identified in yesterday's session? I, I think so. So again, if we go back to yesterday, what happened? You had a lot of the defensives roll over, right? The defensives are rolling over because rates are going up. Utilities. More, utilities. There's a lot of leverage in utilities, a lot of leverage in staples. Where are people running to? They're running to Uber caps. Uber caps are now seen as that safety trade. If Uber caps up, go up, the market goes up. So is that AI or just all of the above? Everything that's in Uber caps right now? Really, every, everything in Uber caps. What we do is we look at the Russell top 50, right? And you have AI, but really what you're buying is you're buying 
at a premium of 10 to 15 percent to the market, stable balance sheets, less volatility, better earnings with an AI kicker. And that's not bad. When you say yesterday it was buy the new economy, sell the old economy, I thought that was really interesting, which raises a question, are we going to just get more of the same in terms of the dynamic of the Magnificent Seven or a basket of stocks that are leveraged to artificial intelligence, the new tech gains, really outperforming while everything else not only lags but loses value? I I think so. That's been our call. So what we've been saying is that we thought you'd have a broadening out of the market um, in the summertime, in, in the spring. But that was partly because people thought, hey, the economy is not going to be as bad as expected. What you need for small caps and mid caps to do better is a much stronger economy. And that's just not going to come to fruition. So we do think it's going to be narrow. We do think the Uber caps are the ones that that outperform. Alicia, you asked the question exactly where I was, but I would narrow it even further to say technology, new economy that's profitable and displays free cash flow versus many of them that do not. Out in the zeitgeist today, Ala Lori Calvacina is a percent of Russell 2000. That's not profitable. That's not Apple. Just real quick here, as you're talking about this, we're seeing 10-year yields climb through uh, intraday highs going back to 2007. At what point with yields, Chris, do yeah. you rethink your assumption? Well, l- let's talk big picture on yields, right? So. If you look at real rates, and let's just say real, we go back two decades, real rates, the high end is about 2%. If you look at inflation expectations or break evens, the high is about two and a half. You've gotten above that, but not for a sustained period of time. I think maybe back in 06, 07. So two and a half plus two, as best I know, is four and a half. We're in and around those levels. Now we get to five. Well, the components start to, then all of a sudden, what we've been seeing is real rates going higher. Now the back end's a lot more restrictive that's going to weigh on the economy. Ultimately, that's going to sow the seeds of bringing it back down. We can get to these levels, but what's going to happen is it's going to slow down the economy a lot, lot faster, and then things will come back down once the economy slows down. Hey, Chris, this was awesome. It's good to see you, as always. (laughs) Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo on this equity market. This equity market a bit softer this morning as that sell-off in the Treasury market picks up. Yields are higher by, let's call it, four basis points right now, just short of 172, 472, rather. I think some people maybe wishing the equity market was 172 again, <laughs> yep. but we're not there. 472 on a 10-year at the moment, 471.82 on a US 10-year in America, Tom. You've got to go all the way back to 07. Yeah, it's really interesting to see. I got the 10-year real yield here, and it's spiky, spiky in the basque back up to this level. But to be honest here, you can get back 21 years to where you really came down within the great moderation to this level of real yield. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. Your S&P 500 negative hit by zero. 0.17%. Yields are high by four basis points. The dollar is stronger off the back of this. The euro's breaking down. It's the 12th week of euro weakness against dollar strength. 104.70 on the euro. Negative there by about 0.1%. In the next hour, TK, Michael O'Rourke Jones trading yeah. at 8 a.m. Eastern time. Yeah, and for those of you with a global sense and the interdependencies of the market, I'm bringing it up right now, John. I've got yen breaking through to 149.91, almost buttressed up against the high about 3 a.m. this morning. Now we need to talk politics, don't we, Bramo? With AMH in about 10 minutes. We're doing this all over again into November 17th, yeah, except it's messier much. this time because we don't know who's going to be the speaker. That's basically what we heard uh, in her interview with Jim Jordan yesterday. At some point, there just seems to be a deja vu all over again, just simply because nobody's dealing with the real issues and there is no conviction right now. Right. Maybe some of the people in the center, as Terry Haynes was talking about, it doesn't seem like there is a conviction or the consensus right now to really change the dynamic that is roiling bond markets by most accounts. I, I mean, I, I just think about it. You think of the power of AMH. Matt Gates stood her up yesterday like yes, he had some, that, yeah. you know, fundraiser or something. I he understand was doing. he's back, he's back know, later. Maybe. But he's just, come you back know, how later. do you stand up and record it? I mean, he's got nothing better to do. I think when do. everyone starts to accusing you that you're only doing things to secure TV interviews that maybe you start to like wonder whether you should do so I many mean, TV you know, interviews. I thought he was seen at the bottom of the hay and yeah. Adams at that time. You do a TV know. interview anyway. You just <laughs> do it a day, a day later. Young Gates of Florida standing up. It's rude, isn't what it? What the hell was that about? Chris Harvey's disgusted. Lost for words. Just lost for words. <laughs> 472 on a 10-year in America. You retire by more than four basis points now. Up next on this program, AMH down in Washington, D.C., on the latest on the mess in the nation's capital. From New York, good morning.
All eyes turn to the U.S. job market. The jobs report, it beckons. It looks like companies are just holding on, holding on, holding on to workers. What you see is what you get. We're seeing a lot of strength. This Friday, Tom, Jonathan, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. This is exactly what the Fed is looking for. They now believe you can get back to 2% without damaging the labor market at all. We might get a bigger whammy than we expect. The September Jobs Report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I think the American people deserve to know the coalition that really governs them. And Kevin McCarthy likes to pretend that he makes coalition with conservatives, but all he really does is break his word with conservatives. The yellow brick road of working with Democrats has been paved, constructed, engineered, and architected by Kevin McCarthy. If he's able to stay in power, it will be him working for the Democrats, continuing to do their bidding. So this is a revealing exercise, and I think it'll show the country who's really in Just charge. Congressman Matt Gates there of Florida speaking after finding a resolution late Monday to oust Kevin McCarthy as House Speaker. The internal politics messy down in Washington, D.C. The bond market's getting messier as well. Check out Treasuries right now. Your 10-year yield selling off. Yields higher by more than four basis points. 4.72. 44. That's a 10-year Treasury lower. Yields higher. With that, dollar stronger. Just a touch of dollar strength against the weaker euro. 104.71 on the euro, Tom. That currency pair negative 0.05%. Interesting, and a lot to talk here about. We're going to chat on the markets here through the morning here. We're all watching different things here is what we do on surveillance. Again, the real yield shocking now out four beeps, out of control, 2.37%. Because of the events in Washington, we'll go immediately to Anne-Marie Horton, our Bloomberg. Matt Gates stood me up correspondent. He was scheduled to be with AMH and Mr. Matthew yesterday, but he had a matter at hand. We'll digress, John, right now to the campaign of 2024, and I go back years ago to the gentleman from New Jersey, Ribikoff, who lost a family member in Georgetown in a tragic crime accident. This is not as dramatic yesterday, but Mr. Quayer of Texas had a carjacking in the Navy yard, and it just speaks to where we're going in 2024, affecting all of our listeners and viewers, and that is in 2024, who's going to be soft on crime. The crime at the heart of the nation's capital. Anne-Marie, let's start there. On that incident specifically, what's the latest? Well, we do know that Representative Henry Cuellar is okay, but his car was hijacked, as Tom said, and this was taking place in Navy Yard yesterday. Um, He is safe. He's actually coming on the program this evening. He was scheduled to come on the program this evening. Um, You know, he is a representative of a district that borders with Mexico. So he's very vocal about what needs to be done. He's a Democrat, but he's very vocal about what needs to be done when it comes to the border. But this isn't the first incident we've seen in Washington, D.C., where actually an elected official um, was at the center of um, of a crime. Uh, so this is something that's going to get a ton of attention. Um, but there's been a spike in crime in Washington, D.C. Just five days ago, the levels where we're at this year for homicides is the most it's been since the early 90s. So this is a big concern for a lot of individuals. The percentage change is shocking, Tom. Going through the numbers from the yeah. Metropolitan Police, car thefts, motor vehicle thefts have soared 106% so far this year. Robberies up 68%. In the same period, homicides have surged 37 percent. That's the nation's capital, Tom. Washington, D.C. Well, Emory, this is important. And and to bring it back to Nixonian themes of soft on crime, what is a Democrat response in D.C.? We understand there's only four Republican voters in D.C. What is the Democratic Party response to what we're seeing in D.C. and, frankly, around the country? Well, I think that I think there's going to be a growing chorus of individuals who say that D.C. has to get tougher on crime. Um, Jonathan just went, went through the statistics. This is something a lot of people talk about. They just feel that the city is more unsafe. They're worried about their cars. They're worried about walking on the streets, whether it's right. the middle of the day or even at night. And I think you're going to see more Democrats realize right. that they need to be not just outspoken about this, but potentially push the mayor to do more here. The theme into 2024. Let's go into the theme into Wednesday of this week. Amory Horton, what is the to-do list for the Speaker of the House this morning? Shore up his votes. I mean, uh, this is something we haven't seen actually happen 
is since 1910, but obviously there is concern that McCarthy could lose his speakership. The most important two meetings that are going to happen this morning is the Democratic and Republican caucus. Both of those groups will meet at 9 a.m., and really it does feel like the fate of Speaker McCarthy is the hands of the majority leader of the Democratic Party, Hakeem Jeffries. Um, McCarthy can only lose four Republicans if all of the Democrats vote in favor of ousting him. Um, and what Punchbowl News is reporting, Jake Sherman, is that there are seven Republicans right now who are a hard no. No, we do not want McCarthy or we are leaning right. that way. So a lot of this has to play into Hakeem Jeffries' hand. And what Republicans w- want to talk about it is some comments he made on Pod Save America at one point that said if a speaker right. um, is elected, he should uh, he should be speaker for that entire Congress, those two years, to have some institutional right. continuity. So potentially, Hakeem Jeffries will say, listen, some Democrats, please do not show up or vote present to make the margins easier for McCarthy to clear. You don't actually have to vote that you want to keep him as speaker, but just do not vote at all. Um, so today's going to this morning's going to be very critical, just depending on what either Catherine Clark or Hakeem, Jeff- Hakeem Jeffries decide to tell their conference. I, I find it fascinating here, Amory, the easy way out for McCarthy, which is to do a Boehner 2015, go through the process, maybe he survives, and then he resigns. Is that a possibility? It is a possibility. It's also a possibility that he goes to this process, still remains speaker. I, it is not lost on Kevin McCarthy how important this moment is and what it led to for Speaker Boehner. Remember, McCarthy was House Majority Leader when Boehner was uh, the Speaker. McCarthy didn't have the votes after him. He was Scalise uh, of Boehner. Uh, He didn't have the votes then, and then it ended up going to Paul Ryan. So he is very aware of what this moment means right now and what have past speakers have done. You know, the Republican speakers have been dealing with this for years. But it does seem like McCarthy, you know, at least very openly, he's talking about to Matt Gates, bring it on, and they do see a path where he can maintain the speakership. The chair, Jim Jordan, he's one of the founding members of the Freedom Caucus. He was on with us last night, and he said he has his full support for Speaker Kevin McCarthy. He's an important voice, not just because of the group he, um, he he's a part of, but also because of the fact that his name has been floated. Remember those 15 rounds? His name was floated at least two or three times in those 15 rounds. And he says, I don't want this job. AMH, this is a mess. I think most people would agree with that. And as this mess continues, they're not getting the work done that they need to get done. The yeah. president's tweeting this morning that he would like to see some aid for Ukraine. We know that Speaker McCarthy would like some money for border security. How are those two things going to come together with this going on? Well, this is a massive distraction to not just border security, Ukraine, Ukraine aid, but also the 12 appropriation bills that need to get done on the Senate side, on the House side. Then they have to come to a conference and agree upon it and then send those 12 appropriation bills to the president of the United States. And remember, when the debt ceiling deal um, when they were able to agree on the debt ceiling deal, if they don't get those 12 appropriation bills, there's a cut of 1% across the board. So that is the impetus that these individuals have to actually get the work done. The issue is this is going to be a huge headache and distraction and is going to take potentially an, an, a lot of days. If Speaker McCarthy loses this, then we have to go into a speakership battle. And how long did it take in January for that to happen? Yep. So this is some of the concerns. But when you're talking about Ukraine aid, President Biden is steadfast that he wants Congress to act and move. They feel like their drawdown authority is starting to evaporate and they need more funds. The president, according to uh, our colleagues who had a scoop, is going to be reaching out to allies to try to um, temper their concerns that the United States will, of course, be there in support of Ukraine. But Kevin McCarthy made it clear on CBS over the weekend that he wants border security and Ukraine aid to be linked. He basically said there's no Ukraine aid if we don't get enough security for the border. AMH, thank you. Anne-Marie, on the latest down in Washington, D.C. I wonder how close we are to politicians, congressmen, just having a chart of the 10-year yield up down in Washington oh, for on. when they wake up. What do you think this is, Up six London? basis points. 474 just months ago. I don't ago. think they look at that. They, they, I don't think they... they Congressman they, French Hill they, quoted a 10-year Yeah, yesterday. but he's got a Bloomberg in his office. I mean, French Hill's got interns that have Bloombergs. They're going to have to look at it. He's a banker. they have to pay the interest rate expenses. That's going to become a real issue. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, we're getting closer. I'm not say, saying we're there, but the we're getting closer. The banker from Little Rock is not normal in Washington. Understood. From New York City, Megan Robson of BNP Paribas on credit. Up next. Session lows, we're down about 0.3% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, a little softer as well. Pulling back on the S&P, the Nasdaq, the Russell. On the Nasdaq at the moment, we're down about 0.5% on the Nasdaq 100. Off by about four tenths of 1% on a Russell. Here's the blame, the epicenter of the pain. It's in the bond market, two year, 10 year, 30 year, 10 year. Yield higher, six basis points higher, 473.90. Higher the session, 474.32. The higher the session, TK, is the higher the cycle on yeah. a 10-year yield. To get everybody's attention here and not to stay with it, we'll do the data check here and give you equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. How about real estate? I'm at a 7.80 I'm at a, a on the 30-year mortgage, and I can't quantify the trend, the vector, to 8%. What I can tell you, it's in place. Blame game. Let's replay it at the long end, at a 10-year. Yeah, I mean, a long Rate end matters. Rate hikes, QT, exiting yield curve control over at the BOJ, the budget deficit. We've talked about that all morning. How about China? This from Torsten Slock over at Apollo. Maybe China is behind the rise in U.S. long rates. China is slowing for cyclical and structural reasons, and Chinese exports to the U.S. are lower. As a result, China has fewer dollars to recycle into treasuries. In fact, China has been selling $300 billion in treasuries since 2021, and the pace of Chinese selling has been getting faster in recent months. Bramo, China, part of the story for what's happening at the long end for Torsten Slock. Saying that they've sold $40 billion since April of this year alone. At what point does this just sort of add, I would say not just to the wall of worry, but the wall of uh, buyers stepping back because it's potentially Japanese buyers, it's the Federal Reserve, it's China. Who's going to pick it up? And is there a realization right now going on in markets, <clears throat> hey, the big you know, bonanza isn't coming in to buy everything, so why do we want to catch a falling well, knife? Well, in great moderation, and Greenspan would quantify that, they showed up every morning to buy our stuff, bid up at the margin. And John, you can argue this forever, trees have been killed doing PhD theses on this. My bow tie's a mess this morning. Say sort something, John. Fix you know. it. The answer Fix is it's it. three quarters of a percentage you point on a 10-year. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, People love okay. it, especially in radio. Three nice. quarters of a percent um, uh, is a yield because China was giving us a free lunch, so you have a lower yield. Now we're going the other way. That's new. To hear Lisa and others refer to the bond market, Treasury specifically, as catching a falling knife, I think describes where sentiment is at right now, like sticking your hand in a blender or something, Bramo, something brutal. Really well. Yields up by five or six like basis points. It's like Dan Eckridge. 474. It's Let's turn to foreign exchange. <clears throat> Yields up dollar stronger. Dollar yen, euro dollar looks like this. The euro a little weaker, the yen a little weaker, and we get closer and closer to 150. 149.96. Lisa, to your point, what is it about 150? What happens? The BOJ jumps in and says, no, no more. Basically, there has been intervention, typically, by uh, Japanese authorities when you hit that 150 point. I don't know. I'm just speculating here that currency traders are basically saying we'll go as close as we can and see what happens because we're not going to test it and go against, you know, basically the whale. But at the same time, you can feel them just sort of testing it out. Well, the whale right now is what's happening at the long end of the curve. Highest since 2007, 10 year, now 30 year, 485, just getting closer and closer to 490. Under surveillance this morning, Republican Matt Gates formally starting a motion to remove House Speaker Kevin McCarthy from his position, citing McCarthy's support of a bipartisan deal to avoid a government shutdown as justification for the motion. A House vote could come as soon as today, with McCarthy needing a simple majority to survive. Your next story, another look at the labour market with jolts data due at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Bloomberg Economics expecting hiring to slow, but see a slight uptick in job openings month over month with a total of 9 million. The high Still U.S. payrolls on Friday, 170,000 jobs for September is the estimate. The team here at Bloomberg, Bloomberg Economics, expecting the unemployment rate to hold at 3.8 percent. The estimate, though, Bramo, is a drop to about 3.7. Which is exactly the wrong direction for the Federal Reserve, where they're hoping for a little bit more slack in the labor market. When it comes to the JOLTS data, there is a, a, a school of thought that we might be seeing elevated levels because of a jobs, a skills mismatch. That right now, the skills that different jobs need to fill those roles are not getting filled. And it speaks to the uncertainty of this moment. And oh. it speaks to what you we were talking about John earlier, where 
if we work three and a half days a week, potentially, because of artificial intelligence. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, is this really going to be that just some people tech savvy working six days a week and other people out of a job? It speaks to two Americas or even three Americas. Jeff Sachs wrote a book pushing 15 years ago way out front on the diseducation, the de-education of America. And I have trouble with the JOLT survey, which McKee loves, because of two or three Americas. I mean, there's, there's a part of America that's basically unemployable, non-tech able. Where do they fit in Jamie, dialogues, uh, Jamie Dimon's dialogue with Emily Chang? I think there's lots of problems with job openings because it's so easy to post a job opening, Lisa. It's um, much, much harder to actually get someone in a seat and, and hire them, which is why payrolls is still front and center for so many. And we'll see that data on Friday. Let's finish with this. The trial for former FTX CEO Sam Bankman Freed underway in New York today. The 31 year old facing decades in prison accused of fraud against more than a million clients when the cryptocurrency exchange collapsed last autumn. His former colleagues are expected to take the stand against him over the course of the six week trial. At the height of his wealth, Bankman Freed Lisa believed to be worth 26 billion US dollars. Yeah, we heard from uh, Michael Lewis that as long as he gets internet access in jail, he should be fine. He gets I don't think that. it's funny. I, I, this is just a, just an outrage. We're dealing with internet in jail. I mean, think about incar he's innocent until proved guilty, right? But Lisa, are you telling me he's asking for internet in jail? This was in the myriad of interviews that Michael Lewis, the author of a book about SBF and the downfall, did. Who's uh, taking a lot of heat. Who's taking a lot of heat. And that was one of the things that he said, as there is a, an expectation that he will probably be spending the rest of his life in jail. Really? He'll go the rest of his life in jail? Get the I impression no that idea. Michael Lewis was sort of under the spell of Sam Bankman-Free, just listening so to was that. Lisa. It was, that it was kind is, of weird. That, is the, uh, that, was, that was the implication. Yeah, it was kind of odd. Trying to make a hero of him. Okay. They do this on the crypto show. That's about as crypto as we get. When's the crypto show? Crypto's Tuesday. Tuesday. They do, they do cool. crypto. Today. Yeah, they did that. 1 p.m.? I don't know. Is it? I thought that was... <laughs> it's good. Know. Okay. I don't know. Crushing. It's the middle yeah, of the surveillance okay. nap. Okay. Kaylee nice briefs for that. me. All right, wonderful. Kaylee Lines briefs me on it as she can. Uh, right now, we're going to turn to a really important discussion. Megan Robson joins us here as we look at these debt markets, and they are fractured. John and I are on the U.S. dollar yen watch deteriorating. The real yield is someplace we've never seen as well. Again, Megan Robson, head of U.S. credit strategy, BMP. Uh, Perry Ba, I'm I'm absolutely fascinated. And you go right to the heart of the matter. Forget about all the financial TV mumbo jumbo. A lot of people out there have to refi. They have to do refinancing. Yep. And you guys are expert at this. How in God's name does anybody refi in this market? It's a it's a great question, Tom. So we we do expect refinancing to really drive dispersion into 2024. So far, the the market has been able to handle this well. Most issuers haven't had to come to market, uh, and refinancing, given that the 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 bulk of borrowing that we saw during COVID. Uh, but heading into next year, we estimate about 16% of the investment grade market will have to refinance 13% of high yield. And um, of course, there's differences among sectors. So there will be winners and losers. I right. think ultimately it will drive uh, decompression across across markets. Not that I know, folks, but BNV Baribas of Paris, France, has the single best corporate lunch in the island of Manhattan. Not that I've been there to taste the uh, fancy white wine that nobody else serves except BNP Paribas, but if I'm having a fine lunch at BNP Paribas in Midtown Manhattan, I'm looking out on commercial real estate. How big a disaster is that view from your office? So we see commercial real estate, we think it's a, a well-telegraphed risk. Uh, from our perspective in credit strategy, we've really focused on uh, the exposure to banks of, of the issue. So we see regional banks as being much more exposed uh, to the re commercial real estate issue and some of the, the losses that we're going to see. So that drives within banks. We are a little bit more cautious on, on, the, on the regionals where you could see uh, greater losses concentrated there. On a broader scale, do you think that some of the risks are being accurately priced into spreads that have been ticking up, as John was mentioning, in the high yield space, crossing over that 400 basis point uh, level, but still far below where we were mm -hmm. in the past couple of years? Are we reflecting the refinancing risk that's inherent? 
We don't think so. So we, we have a forecast that spreads will gradually move wider into the end of the year, but we are forecasting a more narrow range than, uh, than we previously expected. And you've seen all of this tightening in credit conditions, but fundamentals have been able to help hold up pretty well. And so we think that justifies a more narrow range. To break us out of that range, we're really w looking for um, the consumer to roll over. So some weakness in the consumer and our, our eco economics team thinks that will happen uh, later this quarter. Are spreads a, a less relevant feature when we're talking about all-in yields at a time where the Treasury yield is moving in a more volatile manner than penny stocks? When we're looking at a 10-year yield that's breaking new uh, highs, post-2007 highs every single day, is that what you're watching and what your corporate, uh, your corporate borrowers are watching as well? So corporate borrowers very focused on all-in yields. I think it explains why supply has been lower this year. Uh, from our perspective in, in the credit team, the, the higher yield levels we think has been driven by a higher term premium in the treasury market. And eventually for credit to really start competing with uh, the investor base risk-free versus a corporate bond, we do think the floor on credit spreads could be a bit higher than it previously was uh, in order to really start competing more with, with the treasury market. When does the bid step in on fixed income? I do not see it on my screen this morning. What, do, do you have a, is it a stochastic call where you just got to wait for it to happen or is it something you can predict? So I think in, in the treasury market, we do think that rates have already overshot uh, fair value. That's from our uh, view from our rates team. We actually have treasury yields ending the year lower, so closer to a 4.3 uh, level. Um, so from our perspective, that will mean credit and carry can still be an attractive trade. So we like investment grade. Uh, we think investment grade long end can outperform if we see some stability in rates here. And we also like the loan market where uh, in, in higher quality, you can get a pickup and carry over uh, double B high yield. Just help me with the 430 call. What gets us there? Disinflation, bad data? What is it? I think it's uh, I think it's just sort of getting back to the the term premium. So we have a term premium, and then also a recognition from markets that that growth is going to slow a little bit. I think that part of the repricing has been a feature of of this expectation that growth can be much more resilient. So part of it has been higher term premium, and then and then also a piece has been this resiliency in growth. And as we start to see some weakness in the consumer, that that could come down. Megan, thank you. Right now, 473 on a US 10-year. Megan Robson of BNP Paribas. BNP looking for a move towards 430 by year-end. Yields up this morning by five basis points. So let's go through it together. Yield tire again. We're playing that game once more. Played it a ton, haven't we, over the last couple of months. It's not fun. The dollar's stronger off the back of it. The euro just a touch weaker, recovering now to 104.80. The dollar against the yen. The yen a little weaker. Higher the session, 149.96. Lisa, right now, 149.95. To your point, it's just like there's this line there and people don't want to cross it. <laughs> it feels like this is a, and I, I hate saying this, a highly technical market where it feels like people are watching and trying to understand why the moves are happening, which is a reason why you get Torsten Slock like pronunciations about China. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. Let's check out the equity market on the S&P 500. Equity futures look a little something like this. We're negative by 0.4%. This from Andrew Hollenhorst moments ago. The relentless Treasury sell-off continued with 10-year yields nearly reaching 4.7 for the first time since 07. I can tell you, Andrew, we've done that now. Manufacturing PMI rising to 49.8, ISM to 49, provide evidence that goods weakness has bottomed and the U.S. manufacturing sector may well soon be expanding, further reducing the likelihood of a very near-term recession. TK, that recession call just getting pushed further out. Well and further out. Yeah, we, I'm seeing this from a lot of different houses, maybe clear from Citigroup where they've already been, they've been right, right, right on higher rates. But what, what you have is if you have good stability in some form of manufacturing stability or up, you lose that disinflation part of goods versus services, and that doesn't get you to the arch disinflationistas. Yeah. Like how I did that? That was beautiful. Six time. syllables. I, do that. I can't do that Lisa on approves. One day. Well, what I find interesting <clears throat> is just that it's like everyone's been waiting for a circuit breaker, recession, financial accident, something to push yields back down to something more manageable, and it hasn't come. And so at what point, if the Fed comes out and says, we're going to stay on hold with rates, does that lead to further unmooring of rates on the long end? New cycle highs on a 10-year, on a 30-year, yields we haven't seen since 2007. Coming up on this program, Governor Ned Lamont of Connecticut from New York City. Good morning.
eventually it turns out that the, it, as, a, as an expansion gets longer and longer, um, more and more of the wage gains actually go to people at the lower end of the wage spectrum. So these are, these are really beneficial things. To have that, though, the record is also clear that we need price stability. That was Chairman Powell discussing labor market conditions with community and small business leaders over in York, Pennsylvania. I'm told from people who were in the room, Bramo, apparently got a bit of an earful from small businesses grappling with high prices. They're really feeling the inflation. Honestly, that probably even more than the rates, although they're being squeezed from both sides. And just talking to other Fed officials, that is the theme that they're hearing, that strength and inflation concerns is overwhelming some of the concerns that some of these small businesses have about rates and where they are. And struggling to hire people as well. If you're just joining us, your equity market breaks down a touch. We're down by 0.5% on the S&P 500. Equity futures softer, yields higher. Again, the sell-off resumes in the Treasury market. Yields higher by six basis points. 473.69. Earlier, briefly, 474. In foreign exchange, the euro a touch weaker against the dollar, 104.74. And Tom's got one eye on dollar yen throughout the whole of this morning. Yeah, well, Just still there, Tom, 149.96 on the yen against the dollar. It, it's my secondary statistic here, and you really wonder what they're going to do. And this goes into 7 p.m. tonight, their Wednesday morning, uh, if we get a 150 print. And as Lisa mentioned off camera, th th this is sort of fun fuzzy to say at least. But John, I got to look at a 10-year real yield and what that percolates through to business in America at 2.38%. I've never framed that statistic. If you have I've to never fund like yourself. sat there at home and said... If you have to fund yourself yeah. at these numbers, Tom, and come to market right now, you're going to feel the pain yeah. relative to where yields were in a pandemic in the immediate months afterwards. With the support of Ray Dalio, in Greenwich, Connecticut, they have put together an annual soiree come October. The Greenwich Economic Forum really can't say enough about that. Behind that in support is their governor, Ned Lamont. He is the governor of Connecticut and, of course, has a storied history here of doing business and attempting to keep business within Connecticut. Of course, all the idea of the transfer of Connecticut to maybe a greater New York business as well. Governor, thank you so much for joining Surveillance this morning. What are you going to do about Florida? What are you going to do about somebody in an X million dollar palace in Greenwich or someplace else, or somebody in a $122,000 rental paying 4,000 bucks a month in Connecticut, and both those people say, I'm moving to Florida. What are you going to do about it? Tom, good to see you. First of all, this is not a soiree. This is a hard working group for the Greenwich Economic Forum. We have a lot of fintech and financial services um, here, expanding here, moving here. Uh, you're right, though. A lot of these uh, firms also have a foot down in Florida. So there's a little bit of a competition, Greenwich and Stanford and, um, and Miami. You know, when it comes to housing prices, we're very competitive. When it comes to uh, workforce and, you know, young, well-educated folks ready for the fintech world. Um, Connecticut is very competitive there. And uh, we've had tens of thousands of new families move into the state of Connecticut, uh, you know, in each of the last few years. So uh, I think we're making progress. A lot of people want to be here. What is your most effective tax policy over the next five years to compete with the American South? Did you say tech or tax? Tax, T-A-X, tax policy. Connecticut, I don't know if you're aware, they have a few marginal taxes, to say the least. What are you going to do about tax policy in Connecticut? Well, look, um, I don't think we'll ever be as cheap as Florida when it comes to taxes, because they can tax sunshine and tourism. Um, but we have an amazing education system, uh, which is a big plus. Uh, we just reduced taxes for everybody earning up to about 250000 So we're the lowest in the region, so we're making a real progress there. We've eliminated the estate tax for everybody um, except for the very top 5% of people. So I take that to account, but I also have to sell Connecticut on the attributes. And that's uh, not just the lifestyle. That's not just the easy access to New York or Boston great place to visit, wouldn't want to live there, but also the quality <laughs> of our education system and our workforce. How difficult, Governor, is it to really build up Connecticut at a time where they are, where you are losing population, when borrowing costs are where they are, where you don't have the leeway of borrowing to build so that they will come? Well, look, let's face it. Uh, we were flat as a pancake for 30 years there. And you're absolutely right. We were losing population. A lot of the older folks were going down to Florida 
Uh, that's turning around a bit. You know, um, during the COVID days, our schools were open. Um, I, uh, a lot of folks moved into the state. Uh, a lot of them came from New York, uh, to be blunt about it, and, and they stayed. So our schools were expanding. You know, the biggest shortfall I've got is housing. I got to make sure we have enough housing for people here. There's a problem, though, with businesses. I mean, Frontier Communications was the latest going to, I believe, Dallas uh, from Norwalk, Connecticut. I mean, some businesses are looking for that tax advantage as well. It's not just older people in particular. I just am wondering how much you can really cater to the tax side of the equation when you can't plug the gap on the borrowing side simply because of where yields are. Well, I can tell you that um, Frontier, which was newly bankrupt, did move their corporate headquarters, but, you know, all the staff is still here. But, you know, Citadel and Apollo and Digital Currency Group and Tomo all moved to the state. We're taking sort of a, an older economy and uh, slowly moving into a newer economy. So I, I like the trend there. You're absolutely right. Look, taxes is a variable. New England, Northeast is uh, more expensive than um, the Sun Belt, or as I call it, the Hot Belt. Um, but we're getting more competitive every day, and I think our workforce right. is a big advantage. Governor, do you have a migrant crisis? No, I wouldn't say it's a crisis, but I watch it carefully. Um, we've had a few thousand uh, migrants uh, come. Uh, we have a bit of a waiting list, but for us, a waiting list is uh, going from three weeks to three months. It's not uh, what it is in um, you know, New York and, um, and Texas. But we watch it carefully. Um, I, they've got to get control of the border. That's just the deal. You're a sanctuary state, aren't you? Am I right? No, that's not true. But um, we do have a couple of cities that um, claim that. Uh, but this is not a sanctuary state. We do take care of people uh, in need when they come to the state. But uh, again, I think um, that said, we've got to get control of the border. What do you make of the attitude changes in places like New York, where a year or so ago they were welcoming migrants and people seeking asylum? And, and now they seem to be turning their back on that. Now they actually have to confront what that looks like. I think um, a moderate is a liberal who is bugged by reality. When uh, New York City has, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of new migrants you got to take care of, you got to shelter. Um, uh, Kathy Hochul's been very outspoken on this, as has Eric Adams. Got to get these people, if they're there, um, uh, you're either going to be on welfare, or they're going to have to be able to get a job. Um, it all circles back to the fact that you've got to control your border. So are we saying, Governor, that what we saw for much of the last several years around this issue was purely just virtue signaling without a price and that it had now been mugged by reality? Well, let's face it. Um, we've had a lot of migrants coming across the border, you know, going back to uh, Donald Trump and caravans of terrorists or whatever he said. Uh, but that said, um, we got to control that. Part of that is what you do at the border. Maybe you recognize Venezuela and do some things to mitigate the pressure for people wanting to come into the United States. Ned, I'm, I'm absolutely thr uh, thrilled to find how we're going to save banking in the Northeast. As you know, you had six football field platforms of UBS long ago and far away in Stamford. And that's sort of, it's not that it didn't work out, it's just technology advanced forward. With work from home, with technology, how does Connecticut stay financial? I think work from home, Tom, is um, a good trend for us in the sense that we used to have everybody commuting back and forth yeah. and um, into the city and down to Wall Street and the long haul. And then, as you point out, a lot of them wanted to be closer to a home, so they moved some of their headquarters out here. But what we're finding is maybe you're in the city two, three days a week. Uh, our Metro North trains on Friday are not crowded at all. In fact, they're virtually empty. We're going to cut down there a little bit just because people have a different lifestyle. And I think the fact that you can be closer to home out here in Connecticut, uh, and you don't have to do that commute five days a week is a, a big plus for the Connecticut lifestyle. Governor, appreciate the update today. Let's do this again soon. Governor Nedamon there of Connecticut from the Greenwich Economic <clears throat> Forum confronting some of the issues that a lot of states in this area of yeah. the world, Tom, are confronting. He's been a straight talker. This is a guy who grew up advantaged. He's, you know, descendants of J.P. Morgan, early executives and all that, fancy schools like Exeter and such. But Ned Lamont has always been a straight talker about the cards dealt, including high taxes in Connecticut. And they've got some real poverty sections in Connecticut as well. But this, this work from home thing, he's in the crosshairs sure. of that in Connecticut. His line just there. 
liberals mugged by reality. Oh, absolutely. I, it, you know, it's a big it's, deal. It's, something, it's going to be a huge deal as we look to our Washington team here in coming months. Michael O'Rourke at Jones Trading coming up next from New York. This is Bloomberg. There's been some weakness overall in the economy from the Fed tightening, but again, as we discussed, much less than we would have expected. The Fed's reaction function is to make sure that growth slows below trend. Eventually, you have to imagine the labor market begins to cool off. While I do think 2024 cuts are still on the horizon, I think there's starting to be some doubts about how many cuts, about when. Investors basically are going to start to look toward the end of 2024. They're going to give up on looking to the end of 23. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen. Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen Radio Television. Same as Monday, markets on the move. There is no bid in the bond market. It's about price down, yield up. Pick your weapon, John. I'm going to go with the 10 year yield, the benchmark yield, 4.73%, out six beeps. Same story, different price. 474 high the session, new cycle high on a 10-year, new cycle high on a 30-year. And the equity market breaking <clears> down just a touch yes. by 0.5%. Is it about the data? Data was good yesterday. ISM manufacturing better than many people expected. Looking ahead to payrolls on Friday. Is it about yield curve control out of Japan? Is it about the debt issuance out of the United States in Washington, D.C. from the federal government, Tom? Or is it about China? Is it about China? Take your pick. You said pick your weapon. Pick your poison. Exactly. When you get a correlated move like this what i know is i'm never right i can think about it as hard as i want and i never get it right you don't see the problem coming but we have not had the catharsis yet we have had the dollar strength that's for sure 11 weeks of it against the yeah. euro about to be week 12 if this is anything to go by <clears throat> the euro at the moment negative again at 104.72 and lisa getting closer and closer to that line of the sand i can now tell you the higher the session on dollar yen 149 98. <laughs> it's almost like people are just testing it, see who's going to step over the line. There do seem to be these sort of breaking points, these thresholds in markets right now. As policymakers grapple with a new reality, they have not dealt with this before, where suddenly the central banks, the policymakers are losing the plot, they're losing control on some level, and they're okay with it if it brings inflation down, except for in Japan. But this to me is really the question mark, right? Have they lost the plot? Have they lost ability to tamp down on yields in a new economic uh, and policy environment? Well, Japan's a curious one, isn't yes. it, at the moment? Because Japan has got two opposing forces, weak yen on the one side, treasuries, or rather JGB selling off on the other. And at the moment, they've shown some appetite to come in and do something about putting the lid on the yeah. move we've seen in JGBs. Haven't seen the same thing in foreign exchange. So let's see if we breach 150 and let's see what happens. Yeah. We're very close to it now. I'm going to go Dornbush 101 on you, which is the second, third, fourth interventions never as effective as the first one. And we are not in the business of predicting interventions here, but we're going to be very attuned to it. And we see 149.97. We're going to do equities here in a minute after the data check. But John, I just want to show this as life goes on. This is the sell side recommend. This is not Dan Ives. This is someone who dresses more uh, responsible than Dan Ives talking about the premiumization of Apple. And this came out with a reaffirm. This is May, like I believe over at Citigroup, Apple will experience premiumization, which I think is gross margin solidity. And he reaffirms an up 30 something percent on Apple to 240. So in all the chaos we're macro babbling about, there's people still out looking at Apple as a moonshot, 173 to 240. There's one interview I've been excited about all morning, not just our next guest, I love Michael O'Rourke, but also Jeffries. Jeffries on the airlines. Yeah. That note that came out in the last week, that if the United Airlines can get their passengers to lose some weight, as Empic, thank you, that maybe they can save Guys. on fuel costs. And they're actually crunching the numbers. They're crunching the numbers, Bramo. Honest. As MPIC, it's a whole new world in America. My favorite was the interview with the CEO of the former Kellogg's, the maker of Pringles and Cheez-Its, et cetera. They got some new division. Saying that we're going to adapt and adjust. We're taking the Ozempic threat very seriously. I think you said we'll mitigate we'll it. We'll mitigate it. We are very aware of it. What does that mean? <laughs> You're going to basically what, come out to sell what more I, what I know. crap that people are buying less of and so that, you know, we, they could still juice their sales. And folks, you don't <laughs> see it here. We're in our wonderful temporary studio. Right over there is going to be our new palace, the Bramo Palace, we're calling 
on Is that what we call it? Established okay. Bramo Cam. The Bramo Cam moves from a wooden tripod to this gorgeous, gorgeous granite edifice. Nice. It's gonna, it's gonna be there. But when, when these expensive. guys are talking about the weight loss drug, I got them looking at me. I got six interns over here looking at me, and two executive <laughs> Qantases over there laughing oh, his ass God. off when you guys are giving me grief about. I just love this that is you, you Does this drug need, work? You, you feel the need to actually tell people that you're not on it. I think that's. That's interesting. Does it work? What are the side effects? Come on, this thing's a free lunch. The side effects are supposedly not things that we were going to talk about at breakfast time. Like it can, can make you very ill. It can make you very Jesus. ill. People and lose strength and not be able to really uh, engage right. in the same kind 815, of thing. 815 on the airlines. Quick data check. The 10-year real yield. I've lost perspective. A new high, 2.39%. I John? want to know if it changes the Warren Buffett trade the investment of a lifetime to go long those companies that have contributed to some of these issues the you know, sugar, sugar water etc you know snacks all of those things well they're going to mitigate it so it's going to be fine all the wealth built on these are some the top of the, of the yeah. obesity <laughs> epidemic in this country maybe we can get them on warren buffett if you want to join <laughs> us to talk about it please come join us it'd be lovely to talk about yeah, it yeah. it really would but i sense they probably won't come on and talk about it equities on the s p negative by 0.5 percent on the s p 500 a little bit softer yields a whole lot higher 10-year new cycle high if we get up the board there we go six seven basis points higher on a 10-year tom 474 53. Right now, the perfect guest in the equity markets, particularly the trenches of actually what do you make about the short-termism that's out there, the short-term trends. Michael O'Rourke, decades of experience at Jones Trading. Uh, Michael, in the old days, you and I had OTC traders. <clears throat> we'd call them up or we'd give them Giants tickets and they'd tell us what the hell was going on. We don't have those old days anymore. What do you perceive in the equity market now? What is the, the tone that you see? So I thought the uh, utility sector provided a great signal yesterday. The group was down 5% most of the day, closed down almost 5%. And I think what we're witnessing here is the, the broad tape, the broad market investors waking up to this new interest rate environment. And obviously, we, you, you focused on it significantly this morning. And I think that's what's going on. You're seeing um, we've been in this low rate environment, obviously, coming out of the zero interest rate environment from the Fed post global financial crisis for a long time. And we've continually expected the Fed to cut every, you know, in six months throughout this tightening cycle. I think the market sees that's going away and we're starting to see multiples contract and recognize that rates are good, definitely going to be higher for longer. But um, you're, what you're seeing is you're going to hit air pockets on the way down as you go back to more traditional multiples for stocks. Michael, have you got a decent read on why yields are so much higher? on the long end, because we've had so many different explanations on that. The focus over the last week, a little bit more on the budget deficit out of Washington. What's your focus on? Well, it's funny, you, you know, you had your list of headwinds to start the segment earlier this morning, and, and they're all out there. The budget deficit's out there. Uh, I, the higher for longer is is coming to a reality where the market's been in denial of that, that thinking we're in this low inflation environment that you know, was pretty much driven by China the past two decades. That's gone away. I'm a big believer that the natural rate of interest is, or the neutral rate is higher than where the Fed sees it as being now. So just on, on those measures alone, you have to sit there and say, there's a risk that interest rates are gonna be higher, you know, not just for longer, you know, it could have been, we've seen generational lows in interest rates going forward the same way the early 80s were a generational peak in interest rates. And I think that's what the market's starting to acknowledge right now. Michael, how much has the broader market or, or different markets really adjusted to the idea that you're putting forward that perhaps the 10 years reflecting more accurately, which is higher rates for longer and higher, possibly nearing 5%? Yeah, I, I, I think we're starting that process now. And that's why I think yesterday's action was really interesting. Um, because if you go back the past two decades, the uh, the average multiple for the S&P 500 when the 10 year yields within 10 basis up points of either direction of these current levels, um, it's about 14 percent lower. If you're using a forward P ratio, it's about 17, 18 percent lower. So there's a lot of room for this market to correct. I mean, the the uh, the, the premiumization call you're talking about, there was another one about the uh, about the um, magnificent seven yesterday saying that their premiums, you know, uh, valuations, the closest cheapest has been in six years. Um, 
again, those premiums are going to get tighter if multiples right. for the broad market continue to contract. So there's still risk there, and I think people are missing that. Frame it out on VIX, 18.54. We did this with Dean Kern at the start the, the morning off. Michael O'Rourke, where's catharsis on the VIX right now? Don't give me this 20 level. Give me some drama. No, it's it's significantly higher. Like, there's a lot of risk in this tape. Um, I think this cha- Q4 is going to be very challenging. When I was talking about the PE multiple and you go into next year, we're still, Mark is still expecting 10% earnings growth. We have the highest interest rates we've had in 16 years. I think that's just hard to achieve. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I, I think you're, you, you'd have to see the Dix North of 30 to see, you know, some type of bottoming process. I think there's a lot of risk going forward here, and the market's only now starting to price it in. As you mentioned, utilities have suffered. Discretionary's been getting battered over the last couple of weeks as well. Where do you see, under the lid of the S&P 500, lift the lid and get into it, where do you see which sector is the most vulnerable? Oh, I, 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 I definitely think it's the, it's the, the groups that are leading, whether it's tech communications and um, consumer discretionary, because they have these premium multiples. You're talking about the biggest stocks in the world. They were trading at almost double the premium of the market. Now it's 1.6 or 1.7 times the, pre- the, the multiple of the market. And again, those, those premiums will contract, and that's where the big risk for the tape comes into play. Um, Four, almost four out of every five names was down yesterday in the S&P 500 and the Russell 3000. The rest of the market's pricing in risk and has been pricing in risk. It's those big names that are supporting the index um, that are where the larger risk comes into play because if they start breaking down and selling off, you're going to feel it even more in the rest of the index as well. So it's just, like I said, you're, it's going to be a tough Q4. And then you throw in this whole um, government shutdown being – you know, I guess, avoided for 45 days uh, leading into the week before Thanksgiving. It just gives investors another reason to be more defensive in Q4. And just, you know, we've had a pretty good year for the S&P 500. It's, you know, it's a good signal to take your profits and walk. Well, Michael, just to be clear, you're not thinking about a retest of the October low, are you? Coming up to the anniversary of that on Friday 13th, for what it's worth, next Friday. I think it's absolutely possible. I, wow. I'm not sure it's going to happen this year, but I think this, uh, you know, I would, I'd be more cautious now than uh, any time since probably April of last year. Michael O'Rourke, thank you, sir, of Jones Trading. We could retest the October low of last year. I mean, that's, that's quite a call. Equities, if you're just tuning in on the program, welcome. The negative here by 0.5%. Yields higher by six basis points. The 10-year higher the session. Right up there, Lisa, at 474, just short of that at the moment, at 473.69. I'm just digesting what Michael was talking about, this idea that the big tech names have really uh, driven everything, and this just sort of is what we're seeing, the pain that is being priced in in other areas. Does this get us to a market that might be higher, (laughs) but under the hood, a very painful reality of dealing with rates where they are? How much does this disconnect grow over time in the haves and the have-nots of the American economy? We've mentioned twice today, I think it's so important to separate profit-making, free cash flow companies and juggernauts from everybody else. Andrea Felstead, John, to your interest in LVMH, has a brilliant essay with brilliant charts today about the free cash flow generation of a Celine t-shirt. It's at, you know what those things run? You know, oh, how much? I, you know, I thought me, they'd please. be like champion of Rochester, New York, you please. know, $22. I thought they'd be coming mm. at 29 if it's a, my size, you know, if they made them. But it, it's just the markup is, are you kidding me? They make them in the same damn factory. Yeah, I think you might be projecting a little bit on the, yeah. my, my interest with LVMH. Well, I don't mean I LVMH, but, but, but Andrea Fels said kills it here. Mine. They've pulled back in margin, but Lisa, they're profitable. They're growthy. So buy luxury and buy tech. I don't know, you know. But honestly, I just think just it's... don't put the T-shirt in the dryer. That's the pro tip. And things shrink. They do. They do. <laughs> We're going back to that, huh? We are. We can't get away from it. <laughs> Evidently. We'll catch up with Jeffries on the airlines next. All eyes turn to the U.S. job market. The jobs report, it beckons. It looks like companies are just holding on, holding on, holding on to workers. What you see is what you get. We're seeing a lot of strength. This Friday, Tom, Jonathan, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. This is exactly what the Fed is looking for. They now believe you can get back to 2%. 
without damaging the labor market at all. We might get a bigger whammy than we expect. The September Jobs Report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. At this point, I suspect we may well need to raise the Fed funds rate once more this year and then hold it there for some time as we accumulate more information on economic developments and assess the effects of the tightening of financial conditions that has already occurred. Loretta Mester there, the Cleveland Fed president, speaking to business leaders and lawyers at the 50 Club of Cleveland. If you're just tuning in, welcome. Equities near session lows. We're down here by 0.6% on the S&P. Yields near session highs up by six basis points to 473.90. The dollar stronger off the back of that. The euro negative by 0.1%. Let's round that down. 104.69 on the euro against the dollar. Been looking forward to this conversation all morning. Rising fuel costs weighing on the airlines, but there could be a positive just around the corner. As new weight loss drugs hit the market, Sheila Kayalu of Jefferies crunching the numbers and writing this. United Airlines would save $80 million a year if the average passenger weight falls by 10 pounds. This would trim 1,790 pounds from every United flight, implying a saving of 27.6 million gallons a year. TK. There's some big numbers. This is important, and John Farrell will bring in our next guest. John, I'm going to do some research for you. My father died, and I had to take on very short notice an economy trip. I didn't have a choice. Get on a plane, prima donna like I had to go to economy. And I can report to you with surveillance analysis, which is appropriate for someone who owns electrical equipment at Credit Suisse and now at Jeffrey Sheila Kayalu, that the economy width of a United seat is 16.8 inches and business class is a lofty 20.7 inches. I had to sit up the entire way to Oregon. On the armrest. Because I literally couldn't get in a seat. TK, it's a that's joke. brutal. It's worse than Fenway Park. That's okay. brutal. Sheila, I'm pleased to say, is with us now. Sheila, good morning. Thanks. Let's start here. How did this study start? What are you assuming? What are the underlying assumptions that go into all of this? So kudos to the Jeffries Equity Research Department for pulling this piece together with 30 analysts across the department and of how, uh, you know, weight loss drugs could potentially be helpful and impactful to mm -hmm. industries. And for aerospace and defense and airlines, you know, airlines are constantly trying to save fuel. Fuel is 25% of their costs. It's something out of their control. Fuel is up 30%. The stocks are down 20% in the last three months. And the engine manufacturers like Raytheon, Pratt, and GE are having trouble getting the fuel efficiency across. So we said, what if something out of their control happens and 175 people on the flight lose 10 pounds because of Ozempic or whatever, you know, diet that they're on? And what does that do? And we took a stat going back to 2000. 2018 that poor United Airlines put out there. They saved an ounce um, on on every uh, passenger seat from taking out, changing the feedstock of the paper that they used on their United Airlines magazine and saving 11 pounds for, per flight. What? Uh, uh, yeah, and so we extrapolated that into 10 pounds per passengers, 175 people per plane. What happens to the fuel savings? They save 27 million versus the 42 billion that they use. So they use a lot of fuel and it's only 2%, but hey, it's a savings out of their control and you don't need a new engine for that. So this is a what if. Are you prepared to say that this is a proxy now for Azempic and we should get long United Airlines? Are you uh, there yet? <laughs> I think across the airline space, variable costs is very difficult for them to manage um, with fuel going up. So in all seriousness, that is impacting uh, shares of the airline so far. Labor costs are up 40% as well. So uh, with their with 50% of their costs up significantly over the last few months. It's definitely weighed on the airlines. And we're going to see that into Q Q3 earnings that are, that are coming up in two weeks' time. Um, but, you know, the cost element is weighing, and also the revenues are as well because yeah. of pricing problems. Lisa had a surveillance golf stream on her last soiree. I had to go back and actually Scott <laughs> Kirby, Air Kirby, United Airlines. I was thunderstruck at the percent of business class seats. The more I look back, it's bigger and bigger. One study is they've gone from 30 seats to 46 seats. When is the time where business class simply takes over their profit proposition? So what's going on in the airline industry right now, it's the haves and the have-nots. For the first time in such a long time, the network carriers like United and Delta are having their way because that premium passenger is holding up the pricing element and the mainline cabins are actually seeing price deceleration year over year and overcapacity to leisure markets like Florida. So 
you're, you're really seeing a tale of two markets where Southwest, JetBlue, um, you know, are pre-announcing pretty negative results on their visibility and Delta and United are seeing premium pricing happen. So that's because of the business class. Let's put that together. This idea of the potential for weight loss to inc uh, improve the margins for some of these companies and the idea that a lot of the companies are earning the most from the front of the cabin. How much can they really push in terms of extra expenses before they have a real PR problem? In other words, what would happen if you had a company come out, one of the discount uh, carriers, and say, we're going to weigh everybody before they get on the plane, and if you're over this point, we're going to charge you more? I mean, I, I think that's part of the problem with the discount carriers is, you know, there's no seat assignments. It's a lot more difficult. There's no variability in the class you sit in. So I, I think we're far away from weighing passengers, but this was just, We you weigh know, backs, don't we? Yeah. Well, you know, they I mean, weigh backs. You get punished if your back is too heavy. Don't you? Well, okay, but th this to me is the issue. It's like, how much can people handle? How much can people put up with paying for water, paying for drinks, paying for snacks, paying for the air you breathe, paying for how much you weigh? I mean, at a certain point, you know, when does this become a real problem? That 10 pounds of weight loss, where does that 10 pounds come from? Are you making assumptions of what could happen to the average weight of the passenger? Do you yeah. think that's something that actually could happen? Yeah, I, I, I think according to these weight loss drugs, clearly I'm not on them, but you know, people tend to be on them. But um, if they do lose an average of 10 pounds, uh, 175 passengers per narrow body, wide bodies are 300. Um, it would be a significant fuel cost savings. And it was actually in light of, um, because we cover the air, airlines, uh, the aircraft OEMs like Boeing and the engine guys like GE and RTX, and they're having such mega issues building these aircraft. It was just a fun way of looking at something that's completely out of their control, not having to do with making a fuselage with Spirit. That stock's down 45%, just changed its CEO yesterday. Um, and the engine manufacturers, obviously, Pratt is having a tough time with the contamination in their engine. So it was a different angle of looking at something completely out of their control. JetBlue's struggling as well, so let's get to the nuts and bolts of what's happening right now. Are you starting to see limits to the consumer appetite for flying domestically in America? Are we seeing that happen now? So it's a matter of, that's our debate in Q3. We're gonna see what results have to, have to bring. We downgraded Southwest Airlines to an underperform in the beginning of August on that structural call, that the US domestic consumer is in a tough spot, student loans are coming back, it's weighing on their savings, so that mainline pa cabin passenger is going to see some difficult times. You know, pricing is up about 10% versus 2019 levels. We saw Q2 pricing on the mainline cabin down 1%. Very different than the story we're seeing in the premium business class cabin. Very different than transatlantic up 25% versus 2019 levels. So it's a matter of where we, you know, what we see in Q3 results. John, I look at two flights. I just ran through the Paris flight, which I think at one point was $7,000, even $9,000 thousand dollars in pandemic and all that shocking statistic two thousand six hundred twelve dollars business class to paris out a couple months like when you're planning months out economy used to be 700 even 900 dollars it's now 534 but the ratio is still 4.9 to 1 you pay sure. a premium to fly pharaoh you pay a premium just to be clear <laughs> okay, just to be very you. clear Sheila, thank you thanks guys Sheila kailu much. of jeffrey's on the latest on the airlines. Coming up in the next hour on Bloomberg TV, Ashok Badia of New Berger Berman, Matt Miskin of John oh, Hancock wonderful. Investment Management, wonderful. Cameron Dawson of New Edge Wealth to try and navigate our way through some of these bond market issues with a 10-year yield. Just pulling back from <clears throat> cycle highs. Your 10-year cycle high was 474.74 earlier in the session, Tom. We're back down to yeah. about 472 at the moment. Stay on that, folks, and particularly Global Wall Street. Matt Miskin has just a depth coverage of financial, of fixed income dynamics. Love Matt, just, love just, that team, just, Emily Rowland, John it, it's Hancock. It's going back for years, it, you know, different different places, but he's a real deal. I'm laughing that you're saying we're heading back down to 4.72. I mean, if you had said that a week ago, you'd have just checked, I mean, just I, I understand just that. Just off session highs. No, no, I'm know, not I'm criticizing not, that. Okay. I'm just saying, it just tells you where we are. Very sensitive, delicate about these things. Okay? Just put him back a little, I'm all right. <laughs> Okay. I'm all right. <laughs> Good, I'm Equity's glad. Equity's coming back just a little bit. We're negative by 0.5%. Live from New York. Good morning.
Bloomberg surveillance, Jen Farrell leaves to prepare for a nine o'clock hour. And of course, that shakes Japanese yen, stronger yen <laughs> yeah. in the last 10 minutes. We go from the precipice of 150 to a stronger yen, which is 149.93, indicative in the bond market as well, waiting, Lisa, for 10 a.m. data. Yeah, jolts data, which comes out at 10 a.m. But I take your point about the coordinated move as we see 10 year yields backing away from some of the highs, as Sean was talking about, from uh, 474 down to 472. And you're seeing that in the currency markets too, moving away from some of these other levels. Are we seeing buyers step in or just a moderation of right. what you would call a moonshot of yields going remind, higher? Remind me, you said it earlier, do we have Fed speakers today? We do. We have Rafael Bostic coming out. Yeah. I believe uh, he did about a half an hour right. ago, so I will look and see what Joining he said. Joining us now, our chief speaker analysis, always a jolting interview. Michael McKee joins us. Bloomberg Major that was League. nice. You combined the two thoughts. I did. Well, I'm going to combine three in here, which is we got Major League Baseball. Finally, the real season oh starts uh, tonight. Mindy of Bloomberg briefed me yesterday on the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, this is a, a Mindy brief is a lecture. I got a lecture for <laughs> 20 lecture. minutes. We'll have more on a majesty. I can't say enough about the excitement of going into the World Series. Uh, Mike, Mike McKee, I want to, you know, I got, I got to get to jolts as well, but I want you to glean your expertise on what the four worthies said yesterday in Fed speech. What did you learn? Well, we're pretty evenly divided. You've uh, got people like John Williams and uh, Tom Barkin, I'll throw them in from the end of last week, saying we have time to act carefully, to uh, think right. about what we want to do. And then you have Loretta Mester and Mickey Bowman saying, we think we need to raise rates one more time. Does it really make all that much of a difference? I think Michael Barr, who is the uh, vice president for supervision, doesn't usually talk about monetary policy, but he did uh, yesterday. He said, it's not so much about raising rates once more, it's how long we are going right. to keep rates high. That's the real question. So what's happening at the Eccles building now with the first and second derivative of interest rate moves? We talk monetary policy, Bramo parlor game, what are we going to do? Forget about all that malarkey. Michael Barr. What is he in his bank supervision doing to study this interest rate move on our banking system? Well, he talks to banks all the time, obviously, and is talking to the bank examiners all the time. And their message has been very similar since March uh, when we had the banking ructions is to make sure that you are in good shape. But the data that the Fed has collected is basically telling them that banks are tightening credit, but it doesn't seem to be beyond what would be normal in a situation where the Fed is raising interest rates. So we're going to have a little bit tighter credit. Now the question is, who's going to borrow? How many people are going to borrow? Uh, is this going to be different this time because they're trying to shut off or bring down the flow of credit and at this point it hasn't had as much of an effect as in previous uh, Fed tightenings. Although now we're finally seeing the tightening in the long end. Do you think the Fed is relieved to see the market waking up to what they're saying? Yes, I think so. I mean, we were uh, pricing rate cuts and still are to a certain extent in Fed funds futures, but uh, the Fed is not going to be cutting rates anytime soon, not until they see inflation coming down. Now, inflation has been coming down faster than they thought, and we may end up the year with uh, PCE core inflation lower than their anticipation, which could change people's minds about where the Fed no. is going to be next year. But for right now, the Fed likes the idea that conditions are tightening because that's what they're trying to do. If we get Ed Hyman, David Rosenberg, and others disinflation, and Paul Krugman has talked three-month annualized as well, Jason Furman at Harvard's doing this as well, do academics like Barkin and Williams, do they bring that right over to the bond market where yield will follow that disinflationary trend? Well, essentially, yes, but people are not looking at the disinflationary trend in terms of what they're pricing in the markets right now. They're looking at what the Fed is doing and where the Fed is going to right. keep interest rates. The Fed is saying it's going to keep interest rates at least at 5.5% where we are uh, through next year. And then if they come right. down, it, you look at real rates, they may come down to about 3%, but that's still not going to uh, be a, the kind of zero rate environment we had before. So it's not so much uh, inflation as it is, how do you get right. inflation back to 2%? Are you going to be around for jolts at 10 a.m.? I'm going to be around for jolts at 10 a.m. Jolts, 10 a.m., Michael McKee, be there. Right now, and this is a joy and perfectly timed, the conference board is one of the great institutions of America. To be blunt, full disclosure, my grandfather was involved. This goes back to World War I. 
It goes back to trying to figure out how to aggregate statistics before the revolution of 1947 in econometrics and in statistics as well. On to the modern day and Gail Fossler's incredibly important work and the conference board is absolutely definitive on the pulse of business in America. Dana Peterson is the chief economist of the conference board. Dana, what's business doing right now with this yield move? Well, I think businesses are looking at the fact that the cost of capital is rising um, and they're starting to pull back on investments. And certainly when we look at our consumer, well, our CEO confidence measure, many CEOs, even 84 percent, think that there's still going to be a recession coming and they're starting to think about what they're going to do with investments. But surely they are still holding on to workers and they're still hoarding. I look, at, I look at this, and to me, and this goes to the conference board research, and that is the log convexity of this real rate, this new environment we're in, the rate of change, the speed of movement is shocking. Do you see that in the conference board research? Well, I mean, certainly when we ask consumers what they're really concerned about, deep in the weeds, they are saying that they are concerned about higher interest rates and what that means for purchasing items, especially big ticket items that you need to finance. Um, but the thing is that they're still mainly concerned about inflation and certainly they're becoming more worried about the labor market. The fact that there is more concern about inflation, that there is more concern about hiring enough workers, does that just sort of solidify to you that we are not going to get a recession in the near term, that we can keep going the way we are just simply because they keep seeing the customers, they keep seeing the sales? Well, I think we're seeing some slowing in, 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 in sales. Certainly when retail sales came out in August, they were weaker. Um, and I think the consumer is going to be faced with a number of hurdles, certainly just as of this weekend, student loan payments returned. And that's roughly 44 million people impacted. Many of those people are between the ages of 35 and 49. Those are peak spending years. And so um, when you add that on to the fact that excess savings is running out, many consumers who already spent that money are turning to credit card use. All these things bode poorly for the consumer and certainly with higher interest rates, um, still yet to uh, impact the consumer spending. We think that we're still headed for a short and shallow recession, probably in the first half of, of next year. The key uh, component that we've been looking for is the labor market. We are going to get the JOLTS data coming out at 10 a.m. today. There is a question about whether some of the wage increases that people will keep see uh, seeing will offset the inflation will actually be a real positive wage growth, which we actually started to see in the past number of months. Do you foresee that being the new reality just because of the structural tightness of the labor market? Well, you have two things going on. Uh, wage growth is slowing, especially in services, not so much in those jobs where you have to physically show up to work and you're losing older experienced workers. Um, but inflation is, is coming down, at least underlying inflation. And so there is an offset. And, and for the first time, we've had several months of real wage gains. But still in all, when we ask consumers, what are you most worried about? They're still complaining about food and energy prices. And we know that energy prices are rising because OPEC has pulled back on production. And so that tends to that's a bread and butter type issue. And for many consumers, it doesn't matter what's going on. If it costs more to fill up your tank, and it costs more to fill up your grocery cart, then the world is not a great place. This is the reason why some people are worried about a wage price spiral, because you're seeing the activity of labor unions coming out saying, we're not keeping pace with those increases at the pump, with those increases at the grocery store, and they're demanding higher wages, and they're getting them. How much are you watching this with interest to highlight how much we could see wages continue to go up at a significant pace, just simply to offset that pain that you're talking about? Sure. I think the key thing is that the number of people who are in unions now is much lower than in the past. So I don't imagine that the actions that we're seeing in, and increases in wages due to uh, union actions are necessarily going to spiral out of control and filter throughout the rest of the economy. But like I said, we are seeing wage growth slow. Uh, last year, wage growth was really outsized more than, than it could be sustained by businesses. So we're going to see that slow to a more a right. uh, sustainable pace. Dana, what are we going to see in the jobs report? I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what the numbers are, but I would not be surprised if we saw slowing, continued slowing in the number of payroll gains, certainly compared to last year. 
just looking at the three parts of the labor market, you're still going to have a lot of hoarding. But we're probably going to continue to see job losses in those sectors that did very well during the pandemic and are not right. doing so well now. And then also some gains, continued gains in health care and some in leisure and hospitality. Yeah, Neil emails in, he says, but what about the real wage? Okay, so you got, you got the doom and gloom Dana-Peterson wage decline. I get it. But I also got disinflation. Do I have a level or even an increasing inflation-adjusted wage? Well, I think, well, it depends on your inflation gauge. If you use headline, it's probably about level. Um, or maybe even it de declined a bit because, like I said, overall inflation is rising because of gasoline prices. But if you use the core, then you probably will see some easing or rather some improvement in weight, real adjusted uh, wages. Dana, thank you so much. Dana Peterson with the conference board here on the American economy. Bramo did it. She was out with incisive <laughs> analysis an hour ago and calmed the markets. It's a little calmer than the hysteria of, you know, a bit ago. Yeah, I don't know uh, what we can attribute it to. I'm not going to take full credit to it. There is this question at what point we reach some sort of tipping point where yields are self-correcting. And I'm uh, looking yes. right now yes. at this question around what the relative value is of earnings yield on the S&P 500 versus 10-year Treasury yields. And you could see that gap is getting really close to the narrowest going back to 2002. You start looking at these types of relative yeah. value, you start wondering when you start getting a pressure uh, that pushes yields a little bit lower, at least tempers some of the increase. It's a toxic brew. The VIX out to 18.56, we're almost out of stick. And certainly we heard from multiple people today, Lisa, that you know, you got to get out to to 25, or dare I say, a Lehman like 30, to get any sense of sweat out there. I don't, there, I don't sense the sweat out there in the land of our listeners and viewers. I don't mean to speak lightly about commercial real estate, where I do see some sweat. There is a lack of sweat when people are getting wages, when they're getting jobs, when they're able to go about, things are more expensive and it's unpleasant. But we've heard this again and again. Companies have a bigger problem with inflation yeah. and with hiring yeah. than they do with getting a loan uh, right now. Marks deteriorate, futures at negative 26. Standard & Poor's futures down six-tenths of a percent. Coming up, we're going to be speaking with David Rubenstein of the Carlyle Group, and I'm really curious to hear about his discussion with Howard Jeez. Marks. What? I think that this is going to be really interesting at a time where uh, we're seeing this question about long-term valuations from someone who has decried Fed policy uh, for as long as they have. I, I mean, I, I'm looking at, at Rubenstein, and, and I'm just saying, what is the effect on the Orioles, like, winning 100 games, and they get to sit out the wild-card soiree? I mean, do you, do, you get, you, do you get stale sitting out the wild-card soiree? That's the lead question for Rubenstein. Is that why you were sighing? No, I was sighing because I, just for David and for Paul Sweeney, I actually watched 10 minutes of Duke football this weekend. How did it go? It was good. You know, they're, they're playing some serious football there. Rubenstein called up, and he said, this is an outrage. And, you know, he's, it's, he's like they got, it's not like Deion Sanders at Colorado, but it's the same Rubenstein effect there. I mean, well, did they have a Taylor scene. Swift there in the, uh, in the No, they don't have it. Well, when you're at Duke, you don't have a Taylor Swift there. That's, you know, it's not. Part for the course. That's what they do at Chapel Hill. It's you know, going to so. be uh, how much they're marketing that is going to be really interesting. I do think also going forward, it's going to be a really important day to see whether we could see this yield move stick. If we continue to see yes. this yield move stick, at what point does it yeah. keep getting legs? Or do people, basically the potential <clears throat> buyers, really kind of wonder what's behind this? Data check here uh, into uh, the hour. Futures deteriorate, negative 29. Dow futures, negative 168. The VIX now out of full point, 18.6. Three. In currency, let's go there, 107.20, stunning on the DXY. Yen, 149.94. Good morning, good evening, we should say, in New York for Wednesday morning in Japan. Very important. Sterling, 120.71. Pharaoh looking at 3,000 square feet in Kensington. Stay with us, Bloomberg Surveillance. I would like to see a Fed get to a neutral position, which is neither stimulative nor restrictive. And I, I, and I, I describe that as two to four. If inflation's two, then the Fed funds rate should be higher than that so that there's a positive real Fed funds rate. 
Mr. Marks, Howard Marks, he is with Oak Tree and long ago securities analysis at Citigroup as he came out of uh, Wharton. He has been out front and center on the debate over prosperity and capitalism uh, in America. Howard Marks, great support of the show. Lisa, he's, he, he, he and I go back far enough where, you know, he was just a huge support when I was trying to figure out what to do with equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. He's a tour de force, and he was one of the founders of the distressed debt market in many ways. Yeah. And he uh, has said he started in stocks, didn't understand them, and then he understood bonds because it is a cash flow question of are you going to get your money back and are you offsetting the risk of what you're seeing with respect to the potential for some sort of default or lost payment. And with then has been philanthropy as well. Joining us now, David Rubenstein, co-founder, co-chairman, Carlisle Group, of course, host of Bloomberg at Wealth for a spirited conversation. Did you get an equity call, David Rubenstein, from Mr. Marx? <laughs> No, I wouldn't say so, but I would say that what you described about him is certainly true. Howard Marks started in 1995, Oak Tree, with his partner Bruce Karsh, and in the ensuing years, they built into one of the largest debt operations or investment firms in the world, an incredible track record. Howard Marks is best known for the memos he writes to his clients, which are seen all over the world because they go more than just his clients, and he's very uh, intelligent in what he says about the markets and what they're likely to do. And I suspect right. uh, the Federal Reserve probably reads them as well. On a type two construct, Howard Marks is not so much what he does, but what he does not do. What is the number one thing that Mr. Marks, in his philosophy, tries to avoid? Well, he tries to avoid undue risk. Um, he tries to make certain he understands exactly what he's investing in. And he loves uh, to invest in fixed income instruments. And the main point of the interview was that he sees a gigantic shift from equities to fixed income instruments over the next couple of years, because as interest rates are likely to stay high, in his view, uh, it's likely that more and more investors will say, I don't want to take the risk of equities where you could lose all of your money, and I'd rather go into fixed income instruments where you're going to get a current yield and almost certainly likely to get your money back. And this is what we've heard from Apollo as well, the sort of golden era for credit, particularly private credit at a time of that kind of yield. Before we get there, though, David, how much is there going to be some sort of washout of companies that finance themselves during a low rate uh, era that don't really fit with a much higher borrowing cost? Well, for sure, there will be some uh, companies that don't work out. I think particularly things in real estate, which borrowed a fair amount of money, commercial real estate, office buildings are probably going to have some real debt restructuring problems. But overall, I would say the, the principal issue that he wanted to address is the, I would say, the, the macro shift in investor sentiment away from equities and private equity and more towards fixed income and private credit. Now, of course, um, he's in that business, but I do think he has a lot of uh, truth to what he says. And a lot of people would agree with him. I'm wondering from your perspective, David, you've been in this business a very long time as well, and I'm wondering whether you think that in some ways, because of the amount of money going into private credit to other private assets, they're going to offset some of the uh, lending constriction that we're going to see from banks. In other words, are they going to take over that role more and more as banks are forced to pull back with the balance sheet that they have uh, full of treasuries? Well, the, the banks are generally regulated and pretty tightly in many ways. The private credit market, where you have many private firms that are not regulated for this particular aspect of what they do, uh, they have some uh, greater freedom to do things that the banks may not be able to do. And there is therefore some tension between the banks and what they can do and the private credit firms and what they can do. And I suspect ultimately uh, Congress will take a, some look at whether there's a problem there. I don't think there is a problem, but I do think that if there are defaults and so forth in, in the future, people may take a look at private credit. But right now, the private credit market is operating pretty efficiently, and I don't see any need for regulation at this point. David, how much, though, has the uh, expansion of private credit offset some of the contraction in lending that we've seen at banks? And, and frankly, especially uh, with companies that are struggling with interest rates, offering them extensions, offering them financing deals to offset some of the impact of higher rates? Well, it's offset it to some extent, but you remember, you, the private credit people are still have uh, to charge fairly high interest rates compared to what we saw f three or four years ago. So it's not as if it's, it's a free lunch. So private credit firms are able to do things that banks can't do, but they can't give away the money for free. So uh, there are constraints and there are fewer deals getting done and fewer larger deals getting done generally, particularly when you have to borrow enormous sums of money. 
Uh, David, I want to throw you a curveball, and it's not your beloved Baltimore Orioles who uh, really start strong in these baseball playoffs. Yesterday, we saw a spectacular announcement of a Nobel Prize in medicine out of the University of Pennsylvania. David, that's a school north of Johns Hopkins on mRNA. You have put money where mouth is. I want you to talk about the efficacy of fancy guys like you poning up money, in your case, to Johns Hopkins University and to Paul Fuchs. He was at Stanford. He's the David Rubenstein professor in medicine at Johns Hopkins. Why does a guy like you directly support pure science and medicine research? Well, that particular uh, investment uh, is designed to help with hearing. Um, um, I've had some children who were born with some congenital hearing losses. Uh, my own hearing is probably not as good as it was uh, 10 or 20 years ago. And what I've learned and what Hopkins is doing research on is this. Uh, birds have hair cells in their ears and they regenerate them throughout their life so they never really lose their hearing. Humans have about 20,000 hair cells in each ear at birth and then during the course of your life you lose the hair cells and eventually if you lose enough of them you won't be able to hear at all. The question is can we regenerate in humans hair cells as birds do uh, as well and if we can regenerate hair cells in ears then we would eliminate the hearing problem that people get when they get older. The acclaim, David, of Johns Hopkins is pure research versus applied research. We wouldn't have had a COVID vaccine without pure research like you just described. Are we doing enough in that area? We can never do enough, but Johns Hopkins, uh, Mike Bloomberg has been the biggest donor of Johns Hopkins. In fact, he's the biggest donor to any one university in the history of our country. He's given staggering sums, I think maybe more than $4 billion to Johns Hopkins. A lot of that is for research. I think pure research is necessary if you're going to have applied research. I think pure research really develops the kind of things that we saw in the RNA uh, research that was done uh, at University of Pennsylvania, because it was not thought at the time that there was a, a right. necessarily an a application that would solve the problem we got with COVID, but it ultimately turned out that way. So pure research is necessary before you're going to get applied research. I can't say enough about this. For those of you on radio, behind Mr. Rubenstein in Boston is the research capabilities of MIT, and there's a school up the river from MIT. I can't remember what the it Name rhymes with was. Harvard. Yeah, something like that. David Rubenstein, thank you so much. In conversation with Howard Marks uh, tonight, also at 10 a.m., Ray Dalio will be on with uh, David Weston. Dalio, uh, I guess formerly of Bridgewater. I can't believe I'm saying that. He'll never be formerly of, of Bridgewater. I guess we have calming markets, Lisa, into the 9 o'clock hour. It is a... Uh, more subdued market, right? It's less of a moonshot, less of a steady <laughs> line up uh, when you look at bond yields. For a seven, uh, four point seven two percent on that ten-year yield, though, still a stunning statistic that mm -hmm. reached new post two thousand seven intraday highs at a time where people are looking at growth that looks pretty good. They're looking at a Fed that's going to remain on hold for longer. And they're not seeing the financial accidents that some people thought would be the case. How do you measure the tension in the CRA market, the commercial real estate market? It's a spread market as well. Is there just an easy spread you go to every morning to see the agony of commercial no. real estate? There was a story that I thought was really telling uh, about how there's a tower on 50th Street and 8th Avenue in New York. And there is a law firm that just decided to terminate its uh, contract. Oh, come on. With them. Kravath is going Kravath, over to right. Hudson Yards. 50% yeah. of all of the office space in this building was owned by uh, this law and firm. And Nomura is shrinking down like Nomura. everybody else. Exactly. And yeah. this, this property has a $1.2 billion mortgage. At some point, when does that start getting priced into the market more? Some people argue it's already gotten priced into some of it, but we don't understand the ripple effects. We don't understand where the buyers are going to come. And we don't really understand, you know, the sort of sea change in office property in particular. So that's the reason why people point to this. Other areas of the commercial real estate market have been much more resilient. We're going to have to see. We've been resilient here. Thank you to our team for really putting together a set of interesting guests to see uh, Robert Tip with us from PGM early on the bond market was uh, really uh, something. Futures deteriorate, negative 30. These are S&P futures. We quote Dow futures as well, negative 168. Uh, the VIX 18.68. 10 a.m. again, Weston in conversation with Delio.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Please stay with us.